Uh, day in the life of Bench. Well, the, so, well, what, I mean, I can speak best for myself. University of Glass Shop, specifically for the University of Iowa, you're a one-man shop. You're expected to consult, bring in work, do find parts, components. So there's a lot of footwork as well as design preparation, Here I see a button. Who's doing this? So to look at it, as far as a, a time distribution, most of the time is going to be spent. Kind of the, the, the administrative level work or consulting, and then you've got this little. I mean, it could range from thirty to uh, no more than sixty percent of your time could be actually work billable hours just because you have these other responsibilities that are on you as a one-man shop. And if your department includes you on things, there are other meetings, if you're engaged in the college level, you have other meetings that just aren't necessarily directly shut to you. Last question. Do you need office hours to help facilitate when you need to speak about um, parts or are you need on your work? I'm still learning that <laughs> is the answer. So leaving my door unlocked, just having out the opportunity for people to stop in and interrupt as they as they need or as they come to mind to do. Um, there, that's one model. The other is I've got so much work in the queue that I just need to lock my door for a day or two or a week and say, "Look, email me. Don't stop in." Uh, but it, how much of that is inhibiting? The opportunity for dialogue. So I have I have these feelings. Like I said, I'm still learning that balance. So, all right. Two minutes. Thank you. I was going to say we're going to call it there because I've got to get to the next Zoom talk set up. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.
balance is really hard to work with. That requires extremely high temperatures. Of course, you modify that with you know ions or other glass warming materials. Um, that even obviously lower the melting point considerably. But uh, even still, uh, most glasses have the viscosity of syrup on a very cold day, according to uh, I think it's a Pilkington quote. And so ultimately, glacial glass formation is inherently limited by the, the chemical constraints of uh, working with a material that has, has this rheology or this structure of um, the viscosity of syrup on a very cold day. And I know that uh, uh, my colleague David Sidebottom after this is actually going to talk a lot more about sort of glass structural dynamics, and learn a little bit more about that there. So, in general, why 3D print glass? Again, there's some conventional processing and fabrication methods that have resolution limitations. Um, so, I have a picture there on the top left, which is sort of, you know, you guys are probably more familiar with they're making glass, uh, you know, a glass globe than I am, of course. So, these are stock photos of glass globe in the top left. Then you see fiber optics um, beneath that, and the fiber optics, of course, many fiber, the fiber pulling technique, and they are multi material. Um, but as you know, there are also multi material limitations too in terms of making glass materials with multiple compositions that are mixed. And then, of course, obtaining the materials to finally form the glass often involves significant subtractive manufacturing. So I have a picture, a stock photo of some cut glass just to show um, you know, there's going to be a lot of material loss or wasted. So those are some sort of general reasons why one would, might want to pursue glass 3D printing. And then there's sort of more specific reasons which, which to me, which would be um, and some of that kind of came up when I was a postdoc and it was a little bit of a dream of making one optic that could do lots of different things. And so conventionally optics sort of had one goal. You think of sort of your typical convex or concave lens uh, or, you know, or a collimating lens that sort of has one goal. But what if you design an optic with chemically graded optical properties um, for example, variable refractive index. I mean, you could reimagine the way optics are made or designed. And so I have a, you know, a scheme on the bottom here where I'm showing different types of gradient refractive index optics or green optics that one could imagine 3D printing, but currently are relatively hard to do um, by conventional methods. So the real question for us when I first started my post was, how do you make glass with mixed composition? And really that means what we need to avoid melting because we need to avoid we want to be able to create a form that has a composition we want without it changing over time or during fabrication. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, about the idea of how to 3D print glass with the goal of making refractive index or chemically graded optics. Um, but before we got to this point, there has been some progress with 3D printing glass, specifically via melt processes, and those were the first reported in literature. On the top left, you can see there's a, an example of a glass powder mount, um, and this is done at MIT, and it's through a kiln, and um, it was a very nice piece of work that was done, and I think that that picture on the first slide was actually similarly related to this work. There was some work done with glass rods through heated nozzles, um, using a, molten, a powder bag with a molten track, uh, and then using a CO2 laser beam. This was out of uh, Ed Kinsel's group at Missouri s and and then he also Extended that instead of working from silica powder bags, moving on to um, uh, using a glass rod. But one of the things you'll see is that these all have some limitations still based on their the, the aspect of being a melt crash based glass. They're non uniform, they have non uniform interfaces between filaments, difficult to control over thermal gradients, um, no chemical composition or tunability, and it's limited uh, feature resolution. So, uh, you know, so what we were tasked with thinking about. What we were trying to think about was, was what are the ways that they make glass materials? And so this is where chemistry comes in. So some other ways to make glass materials are by sol gel and ceramics processing. And, and by this method, you can you take a, a, a sol, which is a suspension of nanoparticles. Um, typically, in a sol gel process, you can just stop here and make particles if you want. You'll try to remove them from their solvent. You can make them into thin films. You can make them in, spin them into fibers. And you can also promote um, deletion of the particles and that'll percolate a network and then that network can be tried to make say an aerogel or what would be called a zero gel and then ultimately a fully dense monolith. And um, that's sort of what we were thinking is this could be a really attractable route as we can make nanoparticles and a sol and then ultimately make a dense monolith. And that's some pictures here. The top right is an is a, is a aerogel, so that's a really low density silica block. And then the bottom is a really high density uh, silica or glass optic block made by sol gel processing. 
Now, there are some limitations to solve our fracture. We still have very little control over thermal gradients, which can often lead to fracture and seem very fragile. But also, there's some huge advantages that we were hoping to leverage, which would be resolution length. We can, we can get down the resolution to the size of a particle, which would be theoretically two nanometers. Uh, we can improve chemical composition or tunability of our glass. And then we can mix, we can potentially mix or combine materials in the print to make multi material prints, which would be really needed for making interesting refractive index graded optics. So, our initial approach was we could either make silica particles or buy silica particles, and we could prepare them into a colloidal slurry or a viscous solvent suspension. I think the, we call them inks because the form of extrusion based printing we do is called direct ink writing. And then uh, create the viscous gel in the desired shape and thermally treat it to make a glass in its final form. So to do this, we first did this in 2016. To do this, we had to come up with an ink. And the ink actually design, ink design is actually quite involved in terms of chemical engineering. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video. Hopefully you can see this of uh, silica ink printing extruding through a 250 micron nozzle. I hope you guys can see that. And so that's a silica ink suspension made from commercial silica that's being printed with a solvent uh, that's shown in the bottom right hand corner that's a tetraethylene glycol dimethyl ether. Um, and so we were really concerned with uh, printability. We wanted to make parts that were resistant to cracking. And we wanted to make parts that would fit your ultimately to transparency. So there's a lot of features we need to combine or engineer in these material things. They have the ability to flow, hold shape, not clog. Uh, they needed to fit to the transparency and be easy to handle when they, they hopefully wouldn't fracture or turn along the way. So ultimately, we found something that worked, and we came up with this direct ink writing of um, glass printing method, and it was published in 2017. So you can see here on the left is a scheme that basically shows we extrude the colloidal suspension um, into a preform. That preform is usually relatively transparent. We dry it, all the organic solvents leave. And we'll let the sort of this ceramic preform. That ceramic ceramic preform can then be sintered down to full density. So then we're not going through a melt step. We're doing this through ceramics processing. We can make a fully dense glass. And on the right are some sort of fun pictures of different things we were able to print very early on. So the top is just a tall, high aspect ratio uh, lens or glass window, I suppose, at this point. And then B would be an example of a little cup. And I think this is on the order of about a milliliter. Uh, we then were able to put really high resolution um, grids, and these are again about um, 250 mi uh, uh, micron, uh, actually, after sure, it's probably about 100 micron um, filaments. Uh, then on the bottom, there's a microfluidic example, and there's an example of a multi material part printed with gold doped um, silica and then uh, regular silica on the outside, so it's a dome of gold nanoparticles. So we were really encouraged by this first generation of results, but we weren't really getting the chemical tunability we wanted, so we looked at other directions. Um, but I'll say initially, at the same time of us printing, we published in this last paper, I forgot to mention this point. Uh, when we first wrote this first paper, there was another paper that came out plus or minus a few weeks of us in nature that was also really great. And they were looking at um, direct ink write methods, but they were looking at photolithography. So the way they do this, if you look on the top left, they look into the double polymer. They also purchased silica, very similar to the silica that we use. They made it into a composite resin, which is this yellow liquid on the top. And then ultimately, we're able to create a resin that could be in a, a photo curable, that is photo curable, um, photo polymerizable, sorry, um, under a UV curing. And then they have this polymerizable composite, which could then be sintered into fully dense glass. And so they have this really nice paper where they showed all these great little things. This is a group out of Germany, which I think explains the pretzel you see. <laughs> something like that. And I'm a big pretzel fan, so I appreciate that. We also were able to show some really high resolution printing with this little castle, with this microfluidic um, device in the bottom, as well as sort of a lens lit array, I think, on this bottom in CD. So, really nice work this group was able to do. Um, and they also did do doping as well with metals to some extent. They did a little bit of this in this paper. So, so this sort of became the competing approaches and sort of this extrusion method and now this photolithography method. But again, sorry to get back to my uh, point I was making a little earlier. We're still looking at a lot of chemical variation in the types of glasses we're making. These are still just silica and maybe we're doping in a salt. So, not, not terribly different um, from one another chemically. So, we wanted to create chemically favored 3D printed glass. And uh, since this is also a chemistry conference, I'm sorry to bore you with 
structures and molecules, but I had to. And so um, we make basically silica particles, and then we were the first type of materials we were looking at were silica titania glasses or silica titanates, and we were doing this because. Um, we needed to vary the refractive index by increasing the amount of silica. We used a core shell nanoparticle structure. So this is a picture of a solution or a salt prepared with colloidal uh, nanoparticles that are silica titania. We then were able to uh, reduce the volume and concentrate it down into a viscoelastic uh, gel. And then that gel can be 3D printed to form sort of a gel preform. Uh, which can then be uh, heat treated into uh, to expose the microstructure that can then be uh, condensed down to a fully dense glass by ceramics processing, and ultimately you can get your final piece of glass. And so now this is not silica, this is silica titania, and this is the ability to print it however we want. And that was one thing, we were super proud of that work, and that was work that I sort of spearheaded in my postdoc. And so this is just an example of varying the weight percent of titanium, printing different parts of different um, concentrations. Uh, we then also compared this with some comparable commercial materials. And we were actually really stunned because on many levels, this material was comparable or better to corneas, fused silica, and their ultra low expansion glass, which includes uh, titanium as well as so also silica titanate glass. And so on many different specifications, we were as, as good or better than optical. And this is a high optical quality glass. And that was the big difference because a lot of other glass we had done before, we really never spec for optical quality. So we were super proud that we were the first paper to produce high quality optics uh, using uh, 3D printing of uh, glass materials, both silica and, sorry, there were two compositions, silica and silica titanium glasses. And um, around the time that I was, there, they, we were also trying to really figure out this mixing game. How do we print multi materials? How do you print two materials together? Because again, this big picture goal is to make designer optics with variable refractive indices. And so um, we were able, so the engineers actually, I should say more so than even me at Livermore, were able to come up with a way to actually mix two inks in line to make multi material prints. And what we're looking at here is sort of a parabolic uh, variation of titanium within silica to make a little lens. And this paper came out in a science journal a few years back. And now we know that, um, you know, we now demonstrated that using silica and silica titanium materials, we can actually print optics that are a quality optics. And you see examples of uh, refractive index graded optics. And so now you can imagine having optics variable, the variable uh, refractive indices compositionally drawn into the print that would no longer require engineering a surface figure, that would also maybe hopefully reduce the need for extra components. Because one of the things you may not realize is that most optical sy systems are actually contain, contain more correctional optics than they do sort of directing optics. A lot of the optics are served to correct aberrations created by other optics. And so you can imagine a huge reduction in optical system size and cost. Um, and ultimately maybe changing the way people think about optical design. So there's three different types of um, optical uh, lenses made using these uh, multi-material prints. So uh, when I came to Creighton in my independent career, we did a little bit of this work with Livermore still, and then we also wanted to, we kept on a contract with them. We were also interested in expanding in a new direction, looking at other glass formers. We got into looking at Germania, um, because we had worked with, with Titania, but we were thinking about other things that are glass formers, Titania is a network um, modifier. And so we started looking at Germania. Um, Germania and silica Germania glasses have been studied for a long time, and they've been used in fiber optics in the past. However, they're not the main uh, fiber optic material now, but they were but they're great fiber optic materials for the same reasons that a little bit of Germania dosage and silica will increase the refractive index. It will allow you to create the necessary uh, internal reflection needed to make a high quality fiber optic. Uh, and again, some more chemistry, but just to say that it turns out germanium chemistry is really, really tricky. Germania itself, unlike silica, when you make a nanoparticle, doesn't like to make amorphous nanoparticles or non crystalline nanoparticles, it really likes to make uh, crystalline nanoparticles. So we have to spend a lot of time thinking about how can you trick this chemistry. And so we spent a lot of time in the last couple of years thinking about how do we overcome this issue of, of uh, getting from uh, nanoparticles to glass. And so there's a lot of engineering and chemistry involved. And so I'm just 
to assume this slide here just so I can give you a good summary of all the different things we have to think about getting from a nanoparticle to a glass and how do we design nanoparticles that are to get to a glass without while staying glassy or amorphous. Um, so this is just an example of some germanium silicon nanoparticles we've made on the and there's a scanning electron micro wrap on the right. And this is sort of, um, and, the, and on the left, we have sort of this picture that sort of paints the journey of getting from a germania particle to a fully dense glass. I won't bore you with the chemistry of it all and the science of it all, but, uh, but we have in my lab made a very inexpensive 3D printer to, to, to validate that these materials are 3D printable. And so this is just an Ultimaker uh, 3D printer. Uh, it's, 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 it's retrofitted in extruders, which is doing just a syringe pump. We also have on the bottom left, you can kind of see it in the picture, a pneumatic pump. So we can both use, um, you know, a pneumatic piston set, set, set up and a constant displacement extruder to, paint our, to print our inks or our pastes. And so this is just showing you that we've created that capability here in my lab at Creighton. We've since now been able to prove that we can 3D print interesting glass pieces, maybe not as pretty as the ones we were able to do at the National Lab with all their resources. Um, with silica germania now. And so we're really proud of this work. But in the last year, we've decided to have a little fun and also try some other things. We've also been exploring ways to introduce color into our glasses. Because again, in the past, there are people who introduce color into their glasses, but they tended to do it after post printing. And we wanted to figure out there's a way to introduce a dirty printing to sort of get multi material um, color doped glasses or transition out to glasses. And so this summer, I had a high school student play a little bit around with cobalt doping since we're at Creighton. We wanted to try something blue. And so we started with cobalt. And so what we learned is we tried different points of addition of where to introduce cobalt dopants. But um, number one, we gave example of us introducing the dopant um, before we make the silica. So hopefully we can be within the silica particles. The second one is when we add it into the ink. So it's within the ink matrix. And then the third one, we add it after making the part. And so what we found is that it actually was really nice when we added it to the ink. And then, of course, we still had to figure out how to center, because it turns out the sintering protocol is going to change depending on the chemical composition. And so uh, we figured out the right temperature and time to get a nice transparent blue glass. And so we're really happy. These results, the results are really encouraging. And we're also finding other ways um, to make glasses using uh, UV careful polymers. Uh, I'm going to leave this out for now, because I know my time is limited. And I still want to talk about other people's 3D printing. So that's pretty much it for all the 3D printing I've done um, in my career, but I'll talk about what other people have done too. So again, what, what direct ink right is not the only way to make 3D printable glass. There's some people who did some work with inorganic polymers and very nicely showed that you can make 3D printable um, glass materials that were used in chemical reaction wear. And that was done in 2018. That was a while after our paper using salt gel came out. So I think that's like the end of the year. Our paper was the beginning of the year kind of deal. And it was a really nice little result showing that you can make photocurable polymers um, using inorganic polymers and using the same kind of salt gel chemistry that we use, um, except adapting it uh, to not make full size particles. And this was a very cute little feature they made, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, there's a group now at Rice University that has taken what we've done and, 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 and really brought it to another level. So they're now using colloidal silica that they make just using the salt gel process like we do, but they're combining it with that method that um, Cox presented in 2017 with the sterile lithography. And they're using a microscope, so they do micro sterile lithography. And so you can see in B, they're producing really, really tiny silica particles. And then they're printing really high resolution features. So this little rice owl, I think it's like a few hundred nanometers across. And then these little scaffolds are about um, 10 nanometers, so about the size of a couple of particles. Um, in diameter. So this, this has been really interesting in terms of pushing resolution with stereolithography. And then there was a group recently who looked at other materials that were arsenic sulfide and they were using a volume-based printing but still using stereolithography. And this is with arsenic uh, sulfide uh, chalcogenide glasses. So it's been a really interesting thing to see what other people are doing with 3D printing glass in the last four years, and really the last three years. It's just really blown up since we first got into the space. And it's been great to see. My group at Creighton has been working on this for the last five years. Again, we're really focused on new materials, but we're still lovers of 3D printing. And uh, I've you know, had the benefit. A lot of the work that was done at Creighton was done by one of my 20 plus undergraduates who worked on this project. We've been grateful to have a lot of funding. 
And um, I'm always looking to talk to people who are interested in glass and 3D printing and see if there's anything I can do to either um, help clarify or maybe even collaborate on. So I welcome questions and thank you so much for having me, everyone. <laughs>
Nice job. Ready for the next talk? I want to introduce David Sightbottom, also from Creighton. Pick up where your <laughs> colleague left off. Huh? We'll try. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak today. Um, first of all, I'm not a glass blower, <laughs> never have been a glass blower. Uh, but when I was at K-State on my graduate studies, I did work a little bit with the glass board that was there. It was Mr. Ono. Uh, I don't know if anyone here recognizes the name at all, but um, he taught the uh, glass blowing class that I took. I remember distinctly, he came in every week. He, he spoke no English, he had an interpreter, and he would just do something and show us, and then we had a week to do it. <laughs> it, was, it was quite a... Quite a uh, journey. Um, so I dedicate this a little bit to him. He was an artist. I think some of you know that he was probably one of the first persons who could make a Klein bottle. And um, so for Mr. Ono. Um, those of you who do work with glass probably realize that it's extremely important to control the temperature of glass when you're going to work it. Uh, part of the reason for that is is that um, uh, glass has a very tremendous viscosity change if you can change the temperature. And in fact, there's only really a fairly narrow range of viscosities in which you can practically work with glass to form and shape it. Uh, that has to do in part with the fact that at, in the process of forming glass, you've got to get the atoms and the molecules in the glass to rearrange. And those take time. So at different temperatures, the molecules in the glass are rearranging on time scales that are proportional to the viscosity. And you can see that here, they're moving around on nanoseconds, here they're moving around on seconds, here they're moving around on hours. So there's a range here where the molecules are moving fast enough that you can practically move and manipulate this material in between being too liquid and being too solid. And um, in the frame of glass working people, they often talk about the working rate which is really just a measure of how flat this slope is. If the flat, if it was totally flat, that means you could change the temperature as much as you want to, and it would stay at the same viscosity, and that'd be great. But you know that it cools off, and that changes the viscosity, and it thickens and solidifies. So the length is essentially the inverse of the slope. If you've got a really flat slope, you've got a long glass. If you've got a very sharp slope, you've got a very short glass. So. Um, my work as a glass scientist, though, is not to talk about length of glass. We use an entirely different vernacular. <laughs> we talk about something called the fragility. And um, the fragility arises from our intention to plot that same viscosity data, not as temperature, but as inverse temperature, and not as inverse temperature, but inverse temperature scale to the glass transition temperature. So the glass transition temperature up here is just when you get to 10 to 12 pascal seconds. And you can see that when we do this plot, we see a big overarching picture about glass phenomenon. So I'm, I'm interested not just in the traditional oxide glasses that we use to make materials out of, like silica and germanium or sodium silica, but I'm also interested in all these liquids, glycerol, ordinary trephenyl, ethanol, things that in principle make glasses too, not of any real practical use. But as a scientist, we're interested in what's making that happen and how are those different, how are they the same? 
So this perspective gives us a broad perspective of the glass transition, not only for these traditional oxides here, but these things here that are made up of molecular liquids. And what we've drawn out of that over the years is this sort of, this sort of strong, fragile classification. Some things, like oxide glasses, tend to be strong. They show a nice straight line in this representation, but there are other things, the molecular liquids, that are really highly curved. In fact, it's like they stay liquid for a long time until you get very close to the glass transition, and then suddenly they start to thicken up. So uh, we actually characterize this sort of deviation from the straight line by something called a fragility parameter. It's really just the slope of this line. You can see this line goes from 12 down to 5. So it's got a change of 17 over a change of 1. And we can see that this has a much steeper slope that's a more fragile glass. So we're introducing this parameter. So let me just get your M stand for fragility, and it's the inverse of the length. If you have a big fragility, you've got a really short behaving glass. All right. Um, so my research has really been uh, looking at trying to stay away from those molecular liquids and, and focus on the oxide glasses. So we want to try and understand within the oxide glasses, what is it about the chemical structure of the oxide glass that affects the fragility? So let's talk really briefly about structure of glasses. Um, oxide glasses form networks of bridging oxygen bonds. Uh, the granddaddy of all of these is SiO2, silica, silica, they form a little tetrahedra. Each silicon tetrahedra has four bridging oxygens. Uh, that's what makes it a tetrahedra. So these bridging oxygen bonds are what make all the network form. Now, what often gets done though is we add sodium or calcium, soda lime, to modify that network. And the thing that happens in silica oxide is predominantly that breaks up bonds. It forms non-bridging oxygens, oxygens on the silica that do not bridge to another silica. And so that breaks up the network. It decreases the average number of connections, bridging oxygen for silica, that lowers this average connectivity. It tends to lower the glass transition temperature, which means you can soften it at a lower temperature. You don't have to go so high a temperature. And it turns out it tends to raise this fragility, so it tends to make the material shorter in its behavior. So what I've been doing for many years now at Creighton University is light scattering. I do light scattering on these melts uh, as a way of trying to understand um, how the dynamics are changing as we change the chemistry. So we take glasses, we change the chemistry, we measure the fragility, we measure how these atoms are moving around. All right, photon correlation spectroscopy is the technique. I'm going to go through this in a real short nutshell because you really don't have to know that much about it. Here's the idea. You've got a sample. It's a molten liquid. So it's a liquid. That means there are molecules moving around in the liquid. That's what liquids are. And so as these molecules move around and you send laser light through it, that light scatters, and that scattered light varies in time because the stuff in the liquid is moving around. So if you record that intensity pattern with a photomultiplier tube and you correlate it against itself, so you take this function and you pass it through this mathematical process, you get out a decaying function whose time scale is represented in the motion of the molecules. Short story. Uh, so what I'm going to show you in a moment here are actual data that we collect, but notice I'm going to show it on a log time scale. And what that does is it kind of makes it more like a step behavior to the function. So it's still basically a decaying function. We can get the time scale of the motion of the dynamics of the liquid, and then we can change the chemistry around and see what happens. Okay. Some years ago, we worked on uh, phosphorus pentoxide. That was one of the first systems we were successful at getting uh, measurements on. Um, P2O5, um, Here's our autocorrelation functions and things we measured. We subtracted off the baseline. And what you can see is that, yes, indeed, as we cool this glass liquid, uh, this time scale shifts over to longer and longer time scales, as you would expect. It's becoming more viscous. We're cooling it down. 
And uh, we can describe this with a nearly stretched, ex well, with an exponential like kind of decay function. It's actually called a Kohl-Rausch function. It differs from an exponential by a slight exponent here, beta, between 0 and 1. But in any event, we can, we, can, we can fit these curves. We can extract the time scale. We can extract the beta exponent. And some of the things we see, certainly, as we cool the glass, we see the time scale go up. We're able to watch it over about four or five decades of time. As we cool the glass, we can see that stretching exponent, that beta, decreasing, becoming more and more non-exponential as we get closer to the glass transition temperature. So there's a lot of information that we're able to unpack in the technique. Uh, I'm only interested in the fragility today, so I'm just going to focus on the fragility and say that when we get done looking at our data, what we find is that P205 is a strong glass bar. It has a, it's a long glass bar. It's got a low fragility, so it's a very much like SiO2 in that kind of regard. Okay, well then, what do we want to do? We want to modify that network. We want to take that P205 network, we want to chop it up. What does it do to the dynamics, right? So P205, very much like SiO2, uh, because of a quirk of it being in a different column on the periodic table, uh, it actually has tetrahedra which only have three bridging oxygen. One of the bridging oxygens is not bridging oxygen, it's just double bonded to the phosphorus. So this network for P205 starts off with these tetrahedra with only three connections. And as you add the sodium oxide, you transform that until you get to 50 mole percent into a structure still made up of tetrahedra, but each tetrahedra has only two bridging oxygens which means it's a polymeric structure, long polymer chains. Um, so we're able to do this, we're able to study from that point to this point, and along the way we're able to change this average number of bridging oxygen for tetrahedra, we sort of chop up connections in the network, let's see what that does to the dynamics. That's, that's a short story. Here's the result. Okay, so here I've got, um, the relaxation time for measuring scales in our, our usual sort of plot, inverse temperature scale to TG. Uh, we're going all the way from P205 that's got no sodium oxide down to 50 mole percent sodium oxide. You can see the P205 again is a strong glass cover. It has a very low slope, if you will, in this plot. And then as we increase the alkali, we're getting a much steeper and steeper slope. Up in the insert are the actual fragility values that we're plotting, those slopes. Uh, it starts off at about 20. It increases kind of gradually at first, and then after about 40 mole percent, it goes kind of haywire. It suddenly, it suddenly becomes very short in its behavior very quickly. So we're seeing in this system a remarkable change of viscosity. We're going all the way from where we are with SiO2 to what are really values that are typical of molecular liquids in that polymeric structure. So we've, we've, we've spun the entire gamut of fragility values in just this one system. Um, at the time, there were similar studies of chalcogenide glasses, not doing light scattering, but doing stress relaxation near the glass transition point. And the chalcogenides, I think, as some of you might know, are glass networks that are made up on, based on chalcogen, like selenium. And so, uh, start with selenium, which is kind of a polymeric structure, so it's got two, two connections for selenium. Uh, but what you can do is you can add arsenic or germanium. If you add arsenic, you sort of form a three-connector thing. If you add germanium, you add a four-connector thing. And so you cross-link those selenium chains. So now we're doing things kind of opposite of what I did with P205. Instead of chopping things out, I'm putting things in. But you can see that what they saw here is that, yes, when they were polymeric, they had a high fragility, and when they started putting in more of those connections, that fragility came down, it became a stronger material. And in fact, there's even a little evidence here that something's going on at the magic 2.4 number, this 2.4 bond density comes out of something called rigidity theory, which is a theory based on the idea of what if you put constraints into various structures, what do constraints do in terms of reducing degrees of freedom? 
And what happens is if you're down below 2.4, you have what we would call floppy structures. They're structures in which they can be easily deformed. They're non-rigid. But if you add additional constraints, you can start to make them rigid. And if you over-constrain them, you make them even more rigid. And so somewhere right in here at 2.4 is where there's sort of a magic, magic sweet spot between going from rigid to being floppy, this floppy rigid transition. So we said, okay, great. We've studied the phosphates. Let's compare the chalcogenides. So it seemed the obvious thing to do is to, to compare these fragility trends as a function of uh, how many connections per object here. So I have here the blue dots are the chalcogenide I showed on the previous slide. They go down, they come up right through 2.4, they come up a little bit. The red data are our sodium uh, phosphate study. Uh, it also goes down, goes through a little dip, comes up through maybe a hump and goes down. Remarkably similar trend here. I think you agree. But there's a caveat to it. The x-axis is not the same thing for both of these data sets. I'll say that again. The x-axis is not the same thing for both of these data sets. For the chalcogenides, it's the number of bonds per atom. For the phosphates, it's the number of bridging oxygen per tetrahedron. So this pattern only emerges if somehow you start to think about coarse graining, what you mean by the network. That is that for our phosphates, we're not talking about atoms, we're talking about polyhedra being connected together. That these dynamics are made up of how the polyhedra hinge with each other and hinge and bend around. Whereas in the chalcogenides, it's the atoms and how the atoms hinge and bend around. So it matters how you define that network. But if you define it properly, you get a similar pattern. That's pretty cool. So we call that idea of coarse grain. We talk about the idea that these two things are polymeric, provided you think about what the building block is. Okay? How am I doing on time? I'd like to speed along here. 16 minutes. 16 minutes? Yeah, that'd be okay. I might end the tab. Okay, well, um, we'd like to look at some other systems. Borates are another system, germinates are another, silica is another system, but I won't do silica. Uh, borates and germinates. B203. Uh, B203 is kind of interesting. B203 is made up of these B03 units. Uh, and when you modify it, it's really a little different here. When you add sodium, you get more bridging oxygens. Let me say that again. So unlike silica, where you put in sodium and you break up things, you put sodium into borate, you put in more bonds. You connect it up more. And in fact, there's many studies that have seen this. The fraction of four coordinated boron that increases up to near 40 or 50 percent as you increase the amount of sodium alkaline in the boron system. Uh, a similar thing happens in germanium. Um, it also increases more of these bridging oxygens when you add the sodium. And so our prediction would be then that uh, B203 should start over here at three, right? It's got three connections. And if we go and increase to four, as we increase the number of bridging oxygen for, for boron, it would just go across here. There's really no room to go down any farther. This value is limited to 16, uh, theoretically. So our prediction is our fragility ought to just go right across here as we take this over-constraint to this even more uber-over-constrained network structure. Anybody want to take a guess of whether or not it does that? Katie, no? you, want, you want that? Okay. Um, no, it doesn't. Okay. No, it doesn't. It doesn't do it at all. Um, this is the data from the literature for the fragility of, of lithium and sodium borate glasses. It starts here. It goes up in fragility as you add more and more of these linkages. Uh, germanium does a similar thing. It starts four coordinated as you add more linkages and over constrain it, it becomes more fragile. Exactly the opposite of what we saw in the chalcogenides, the phosphates. Uh, extreme puzzle, extreme puzzle here. Um, so what's going on? Here's what we think is going on. One thing that we know about the borate glass structure, maybe maybe some of you know this, I, 
is that inside that borate glass structure, it's not just BO3 units. It's a little more complicated than that. It's BO3 units, but about 70% of those BO3 units like to form into rings. And these rings are nice, solid, rigid kind of things. There's a, a strong Raman signal off of them. So these rings, maybe they're doing something. And here's what we thought. We thought, hey, look at a ring. This ring and this borate unit, that BO3 unit there, it makes a connection to the outside world and it makes a connection to the ring. But it uses two bridging auctions to make that connection to the ring. It's like I'm holding on to the table with two hands but I could do one hand, right? It'd still be the same topological result. This, this. So we said, okay, maybe these rings need to be uh, coarse grained. We have to do some more additional coarse graining. So we said, suppose we just treat this as having one redundant oxygen bond. And so every time we have a borate unit in a ring, we're gonna say it only has two connections. It connects to the ring, connects to the rest of the universe. Um, so if we do that, then we can start talking about the average number of connections. 70% uh, of those BO3 units would have two connections, and the other 30% would have three. We'd get a value of 2.3. The idea here is that we would take this value that we have here for the fragility, and we'd replace it over at something like 2.35, and oh, look, that would put it back on top of the the pattern we had before. Okay, it's an idea. It's an idea. Scientists love to play with ideas. So things get a little more complicated when you add more alkali, when you add alkali in fact. Uh, not only do you have these uh, rings, which are decreasing in numbers, you also have uh, the free uh, three coordinate things are going down. You also get these things called uh, tetraboring units. Here's a tetraboring unit. These start to form as you change the alkali. You also get these diboring units, uh, these little structures. You get all these varieties of rigid structures that start popping out in the borate system. They've been well characterized by NMR over the years, and they're well understood. So we would have to play the same redundant game with these structures too. So let me go through one example of the tetraborate. Again, there are, there are borate units on the periphery of these things. They make a connection out and into the object. And there are a couple in the interior that are not going to make a connection to anything in or out. And so we're going to get an average number of connections for something in this borate of 1.5. We can come up with a recipe. We can actually calculate the average uh, connectivity under this coarse graining. We just need to know the fractions of these things, and, and off we go. So this is my first attempt some years ago. Um, I took the data from the literature. I applied it, and look, wow, it swung right over there. And then one day in the shower, I said, wait a second, that's supposed to be 70%. That's not 70%. And then, then I realized I wasn't reading the graph right. Turns out that what they're plotting here are fractions of groups. So I wanted fractions of borate units. So I had to do a little bit of math manipulation. But I finally got into the right form, and I did it again. And there it is. It now moved it right over there. There's the borates. The germinates did the same thing. So it seems like what's happening in terms of fragility and glass structure is it does depend on the network connectivity, but you've got to be a little bit open-minded about how you define that network connectivity. You've got to incorporate things that are rigid units and have redundant topology to them, and it, you know, everything will work out fine. I think I ended in pretty good time here. I've got a second left. Here it is. I'll just put it up there and I'll shut up and I'll just let people ask a question. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Questions? Yes, sir. I have a question. How useful is this information in modeling behavior of the future glasses and how that may? in an effort to not actually have to make batches and test them to find out what is the appropriate applications for new glasses. Can you predict with accuracy? Are we, is that where we're headed? Uh, that's where we're headed. I can't predict with accuracy. Okay. I, one of the things that's missing often is we don't know much about this level of structure, mm -hmm. often in many glass compositions. 
And, um, you know, for example, in germanium, it's kind of vague. Um, in borates, it's pretty good because NMR is a good tool for borate chemistry, but not so good in the germanium. So, so it's really a matter, it's limited by our information on the structure. That so it's just, yeah, good for explanations and so forth, but as far as predicting, we're not quite there yet. Okay. Yep. Yes, sir. Is, is there any vibrational spectroscopy that uh, goes along with this that anybody's done? Um, well, in terms of B2O3, these ring structures have a very sharp uh, breathing mode uh, that appears. Uh, in fact, that's how they first sort of identified the ring structures was by the sharp breathing mode that develops in Raman spectroscopy. Um, not sure about the other structures. I assume they do have Raman signatures to them. Uh, most of it's seen by NMR. Yeah. Yeah. Opportunity for last question? If not, great. Thank you. Thank you. Purposes, we are having a break after this next hour. So stick around. Um, all right, to start off, uh, we are we're looking at this uh, value and need chemists and glass blowers collaborating to build a sustainable future. I want to start with we're all familiar with education, research, chemical, medical industry, uh, instrument industry, and glass blowers are kind of a part of that process. There's this interdependency. Uh, if you look at education, they provide the next generation. You look at research, they're helping drive the new knowledge and technology that's coming out that needs to be taught by them, by education, that's going into the medical industries, what we're doing next, uh, as far as life-saving events, uh, other things, instrument industry needs to keep up. And we find ourselves very integrated. There has to be, there was cross collaboration that is the must. So if we look at sustainable chemistry uh, and leading through change, how we're changing, how, how are we as a group, how are we as individuals changing? The purpose for this MWRM effort, and I will quote, in recognition of the paramount role of glassware in chemistry in the chemistry lab, our goal, the planning committee's goal, is to build community and open communication between the scientific glass blowing and chemistry communities. 
Members of the American Chemical Society and the American Scientific Glass Blowing Society will mingle and hear presentations during joint programming and overlapping society meetings. During the 2022 MWRM, this venue presents a great opportunity for these interactions. From the IPG uh, proposal that we have put forward. So by that, you're already here. You've started this change. You're interested. Other ways that we can be engaged is getting to know the glass board. Ask questions. You need to be informed in order to support the resources that you need and value. If you don't know why you don't have a glass blower, you probably have lots of questions. You need to be finding people to talk to and engage. We've already heard a few questions earlier. There's some trends that may not seem super thrilled, but we need to have those open conversations. Other goals and plans uh, that the MWR and Planning Committee had pulled together. These, these are the hopes. Building relationship between the ACS and Glass Blowing Society at this meeting will introduce a large number of chemists to resources. The glass and ceramics community, uh, resources in the glass and ceramics community. The programming specifically promotes exchanges between glass blowers and chemists to support teaching and research efforts. We hope that the programming will lead to continued interactions between research chemists in the Midwest region and glass materials experts in the broader community. The chemistry community is aware that the value of this expertise offers to research. The opportunity to establish new connections between these committees will be valuable. Joining future meetings and programming as a result of this event. This one time fortuitous circumstance is a great way to develop future programming by bringing glass blowers and chemists together. And we feel that we're doing that here today. Things that we need to consider glass blowers and chemists need each other. This isn't just a one way street. We need to know how we can help, and we as glass blowers need to know how we can help research move forward. Without that dialogue, we're not going to understand what the needs really are and what areas we need to explore, maybe try new things, experiment for ourselves on procedures and processes. The trend, depending on what news source you're listening to, it may not sound good. It doesn't look right. Whether it's looking at other peer institutions, whether it's looking at news articles that may not have the full picture, but you have a, I'm gonna grab you title attached to it. It doesn't look good, but it can change. It can change that outlook. Question that I've heard is, is it the end? I don't think so. So what are we going to do? We have an opportunity right now to start that discussion uh, with a series of other uh, individuals like Eric, Eric had provided uh, to help lead some of that discussion and an opportunity to uh, have some question answer. Yes, thanks to those that have listened through my process of, of figuring this out for myself. Uh, questions for Bench. He's kind of in a unique position uh, as a research glass blower at a nationally or internationally recognized uh, facility. How the, you know, um, especially I, I am a, in a single, a single shot myself, so I, I kind of been seeing this virtual life on kind of a different perspective of everybody. Um, I'm kind of creating a business from nothing. So um, I have definitely a different view than many that have been sitting in their positions. But my question for you is, how hard is it to keep your shop active? Now, I've talked to Kiva, and he, he makes it sound like every other like, month there's like a meeting, are we gonna have a last shop for the next budget? Like, hey, do you have to worry about that in your everyday like kind of struggles, or is it more like yearly days? What what is what's your comfort level on how you see the shop? To be very candid, if you would have asked me back in January, my answer would be different. 
Um, then there were things, at that time there were challenges. I'm not comfortable. There's support that I have here. It's come out of the woodwork that I have. I wish that was everyone. And then we'll hopefully get into some of that comment. But, yeah, uh, I'm not about to be It's not like it's a yeah. roller coaster. Even though I've had some conversations, just because yeah. you know, some of us, another challenge for a, uh, a one shot glass blower, and especially dry oil, there's only two of us. Communication uh, with peers that have an understanding. And I talk a lot, there's a lot of things there because that's how I process information. And you've been talking with Kiva for an hour. That's hard. Yeah, and yeah. Because we shared a lot of function I never thought I, I, like, that was out there. I mean, I just thought those were some weird and like, kind of going forward jobs. And here Kiva's talking about, like every month they have like a board meeting to see if he's going to get paid next month. I mean, it, it, it's kind of was unheard of. And from, from my perspective, of like big corporate class, um, so there are yeah. quite to me, So just quick, there are concerns, and some of these issues are kind of the political, financial issues that we just don't have control of. And unfortunately, there is sometimes that uh, that weight that we just don't have the answer, to and we're dragged into some of these meetings and just don't understand. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so you're you're pointing out a concern within the glass world. world. Um, and, and we've got a number of other speakers to try to also offer differing perspectives on the same concern. And what I really want to do is try to focus on our shared common interests and what's working and how do we uh, focus on that as we move forward. Uh, I think there's more benefit to be focusing on the positive shared connections. Uh, our next speaker is Klaus Paris who is the senior instructor at Salem Community College in New Jersey, which is the only program in the United States where you can go to be trained as a scientific glass blower. Um, he comes from Germany, and he's also gone through the German training program. And so we have ongoing conversations because this is not just a US issue, this is a global concern for us as glass blowers, but potentially as chemists as well. We as glass blowers need to have an opportunity to continue to learn and train but also ultimately an opportunity to interact with chemists to provide the kind of custom and research work that you're interested in. So, us. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Bench, for putting up um, this possibility. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm since 40 years, I'm a glass, scientific glass blower. Um, my dad was that before 50 years. So I'm speaking about like nine years of experience, what happened over the years. Um, myself in the 80s, I was I was working on big flask, two liter flask was the standard for analysis. Um, today we're facing um, NMR, um, all sorts of HPOC machines. Um, the glass part is like that size now. Um, does that make us as scientific glass blowers useless? I don't think so. Um, we're more in the need than ever, not by only producing glass, but um, as um, um, more like um, on as well being on the consultant side. Um, I was working um, for KAT, for um, um, second largest research institution in Europe um, for about 12 years. We heard about in 3D print, the 3D printing, they mentioned KAT, um, the, the research. I was involved in that actually. So the scientist came in one day and said, hey, I have this piece here, can I hold that in your flame? Um, that's a pretty common request of scientists to glass blowers, and glass blowers are very, very scared about that because you never know what a scientist is bringing in. So when he said, well, that's glass, and I said, where do you get that from? Oh, I made that. I said, what do you mean you made that? We are here at the glass shop. Why are you making that in the laboratory? So we started this conversation. Bench spoke about conversation. That's the important part. They had they, are, they have such a lot of knowledge, but they have no real um, feeling for glass. Um, we heard 
what you were saying. Um, you were you got lessons as um, in scientific glass blowing. That didn't. Um, that I hope that helped in, in, in your research and yet to understand the material. You were very very um, um, active and in, in showing how the molecules were moving. I don't think they were making this kind of movement, but it was very. So we're as scientific glass blowers um, being in this um, in this unique position to. Um, between the, the production of whatever kind of vessel and in the real science world, so we're we're very, I think, in the, in the need to to, um, to to continue our existence um, as well. In the typically in a, in a research institution, um, the scientific glassblowers hopefully will stay for 20, 30 years. So. Today is a typical um, time slot for, for a scientist is six to eighteen months. They're coming in, making their research, leaving the institution, going towards the next one. So the, the researcher is coming in with whatever kind of project, asking Bench about um, can we do that? And Bench knows no. The last five guys which were working on the same project, which you are now doing, have, have exactly the same approach. They they fail. So we are saving time, we're saving money, not only uh, uh, just because we know all that, um, what happened before. Um, myself, I was involved in different projects. Um, <coughs> the last one was with Princeton University um, for a accelerator. In case um, this um, project succeed, we're saving um, pr um, probably $100 million. $100 million is a big amount of money where you can pay a lot of scientific glass blowing shops for it. So the problem what we're facing all is not that the scientists don't want to have us, or well, we don't want to have the scientists, that's not the point. The point is that in the administrational area, the financial people try to save money, which is fine, but they need data and they need, they need all the data. They not only need the data what, what that the Schlenk flask costs five dollars more than when we get it outside on a, on a whatever cheaper place, but we're able to, to save money in repairing stuff instead of getting it, um, have to buy it new, or being in, in a project like 3D printing and just saving the time in the research. You heard about, um, they were like, within weeks, um, Joel and, and, and Frederick, they were, they were that, that is like a race in science, and they were like in, in weeks behind each other. And it's very important who is publishing first in Nature. And fortunately, the work of his, sorry, yeah. um, fortunately for me, from my perspective, the guys from KIT were the faster ones. So they were the first ones. But that was as well possible, and that's not what I'm telling you, that was what Frederick told me. He said, if you were not have been there, it would have taken us much more time. So now it's on the scientists because, like Bench said, we don't have so much influence in the administration, but the scientists have. The scientists are, are able to speak with, in the in the administrational level, and speak with us, um, with the financial people and say, "Hey, this eighty one hundred dollar um, annual business for glass blowing workshop will actually save us a few million dollars over." Here. Or perhaps over 20 years, perhaps only once in a lifetime of the glass blowing workshop. But $100 million once in a lifetime, I think it's worth to invest the money. Um, good example, University of Saarland in Germany, got, um, they called a professor in chemistry. And he looked at that and he said, well, I will come. But I have a few, a few requests, of course, nice laboratory, nice office, whatever. But I want to have a functional glass work uh, workshop in this facility, and I want to have tenure position for the glass blower that I can be sure that he will stay there for the whole time I will be there. They did that. Now the scientist is happy, the glass blower is happy. It's a romantic story, right? Happy, happy. <laughs> and that's where we all together have to go. Thank you, everybody, for being here. <laughs> Is that Klaus is now responsible for turning out somewhere around 
20 to 40 new blast students? Um, we have actually 65 um, incoming, and um, in the third semester, we have about um, 25 um, scientific glass blowers. Well, what challenges are there? Have you faced with, with kind of raising the next generation of glass blowers? Um, the idea of the students, um, what scientific glass blowing involves. Um, that it's not only sitting in front of the bench burner and doing some glass blowing. You need to have all the, we, you need to have all this background to speak with scientists on their level. That you, you don't, you, we're not going to be um, as fluent in, in in molecules and atomic structure and whatever else. But we need to have a certain idea of what they're talking about. Anybody else? I think we'll. Have further discussion. Thank you. Now I'd like to hear from the other side of the aisle, uh, someone who uses the glass shop, not necessarily works in it, Dr. Scott Daly from the University of Iowa. Yeah, so I want to first start by thanking Benj for giving me the opportunity to talk about this from the faculty perspective. And so, um, as you've already heard and as we've already discussed, there's there are some challenges, right, in terms of maintaining our glass facilities. So to give you a little bit of background, so my background is in synthetic coordination chemistry. We make air sensitive compounds. So we work, we work with flank lines, we work with high vacuum lines. And my experience working with glass, or at least understanding what glass blowers meant, started when I was in graduate school at the University of Illinois. And so when you walked into my lab, uh, when I when I joined the lab, every single hood had custom manifolds. We had custom glassware that was all built. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Where did you get this? And it's like, well, we have a glass blower on staff, and so these manifolds were all made to, to custom specs. And so that was really the realization. It's like, oh wow, you can you can make things and design things to help with your experiments. And as you're doing tricky tricky experiments, often you know I think a lot of scientists are limited just by looking at, you know, pulling open the catalog saying, okay, what am I gonna pull out of here to be able to do whatever distillation I'm trying to do or gas, to, gas transfer? And that's not really the way that I was trained in terms of how we use glass. It's like you design the glassware that you need for the experiment and that's one of the key advantages. And so when I started my faculty career, I didn't have a glass blower. I started George Washington University in Washington, DC. And so I didn't have anybody there who could help me make custom manifolds. And, and so I was forced to, to kind of reach out to, to other places. So one of the reasons that I'm here at the University of Iowa now is because we have a glass blower on staff. That was a key recruiting tool, like we just heard, you know, just, just being able to have that capability. And I've been, in, have been very fortunate to work with Benj over the years, and we've collaborated on a lot of different projects. And we're still continuing to collaborate on a lot of different projects. One of the greatest things that my students continue to collaborate with, with Benj. Um, Fran, I'll, I'll tell you one story here really, really quickly, and I'll get to kind of the point where I, where I think we can um, make some gains in terms of helping to convince administrations to um, continue to support glass blowing. So one of Benj's students, one of his, uh, his uh, I don't know, should we call her apprentice? During that time, uh, so Fran, uh, so Fran worked with Benj in his class in his class shop. She is now a so she was an undergraduate here. She is now at Colorado State, and so I'm at a uh, Gordon Research Conference over the summer and talking to the chair of Colorado State. He's like, "Hey, uh, Fran was your student, right?" I'm like, "Yes." She's like, "She's been harassing me about opening up the glass shop again," <laughs> and she's like, "Why don't we have a glass blower here?" And it's like, well, well, maybe I can start working in that glass shop and start so I can start making my own equipment because she learned how to make some of her own glassware. And this got them thinking. They're like, well, if there's this interest, maybe we should bring back glass blowing. And so this segues into my, my point. And so one of the things that we've struggled with, so we've certainly had some financial struggles here at the University of Iowa, and a lot of it comes down to finances and really justifying the expenses. Okay, so there's a number of things that we need to do in terms of how we work together. One of it includes faculty really advocating on behalf of, of our glass blowing community. I think we all recognize that that is really critically important 
But the other thing too is thinking strategically in terms of, so when uh, universities are looking at their budget lines, they're trying to base everything on some sort of strategic plan. It's like, what is your goal for the future? How is this going to benefit us going, going forward? And so what we all need to do is be able to think strategically in terms of how glass blowing fits in to the academic setting and not just in a research setting. I think one of the big opportunities is in the educational aspects of it as well. And so, of course, our, our mission is education. We're here to train students. And that's not it, just in getting students into and, and doing glass blowing themselves. It's getting them to recognize the advantages and opportunities of it because they're going to continue to carry that forward. When they go on to other institutions, they're gonna have that memory and they're gonna have that understanding. And that's how it's gonna proliferate and how, um, and really if the students are also involved in this, they're also stakeholders, right? So we have to have them included in this as well. And if they're making those kind of demands that we should have this, we want this as part of our educational experience, that's going to speak very loudly to the administration, people in the administration. So we need, also need to be bringing them into this as, as well. So I think that's pretty much all I wanted to Thank you. kind of say. Questions. Ian, do you got a question? I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you know, you're trying to Yeah. <laughs> um, but there are still opportunities. I mean, so um, cold calling is still not a bad idea necessarily, okay? And it, it all kind of comes back to, you know, what um, just getting the conversation started, all right? And so one of the things I, I know, and speaking from experience here, one of the things that Venge does really well, he does a lot of outreach. And um, I think one of the things is, you know, there's not a lot of students that really even recognize this as an opportunity or a career path because they just don't think about it. So even just getting in front of you know, a, a classroom and just talking about what you do, we're actually doing demonstrations. And this is one of the things that we've been trying to do here, um, mainly through our recruiting efforts, is featuring Bench quite prominently. It's like, look, this is, this is something we have here. You know, and it is a recruiting tool. You, people see it. So we, make, we have videos, we have YouTube, we have things like that that we use just to try to get the message out and to get kind of a, a face uh, and in front of, you know, this this career and actually have like bands working, working glass. It's always, well, you know, students are always kind of uh, intrigued when somebody busts out the plane and, and start doing things with it. So, um, so I think it, there, there are those opportunities. I know there's even um, like one of the things like seminar series, like bringing in people from from those careers that can kind of speak to those things. I think those those kind of opportunities are the things you can, you can look for. Question, I have a question, sure. Uh, oh, or not really a question, but like uh, a lot of that, you know, it's going to, there's a lot of advocacy that is being done, not necessarily by the glass blower in terms of these uh, situations that we're talking about, it's advocacy for the glass blower, which is, kind of on like a sub level of what is needed because you know we're saying what what is the value of a glass blower you know like what do they do and to somebody who's not a chemist or a glass blower they don't know you know they they can you can have a chemist say look at all this research that's what I did with them but their name is like who are they what do they do where are they on campus you have to be in the know, and there are like a very few select glass floors that have made it a huge effort recently to say, hey, I'm here, give me credit on this paper. Not necessarily because I did this, it's important, but it's important for the person who's financing the whole venture to see that they are like such an integral part of it. Like, hey, we needed to consult the scientific glass floor in this paper. Like, just as a fresh out of school student, I wanted to like make certain apparatus for fun. You can't just go really find thing 
things by name from a certain person and say, hey, who made this first? Unless somebody did the work as like a curious organic chemist, like who made this weird two armed apparatus? And you have to like interview the original chemist who happens to remember the chem the glass blower's name. <coughs> it's like extremely significant every single time that that these glass blowers develops. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this comes back to communication. Uh, so like what Ben was talking about, like there's even people on campus here that don't even know that Benji exists. It, yeah, it's, which is insane, right? And so, but that's on us. That's a failure, I think, on our part as well. So we need to be doing better both as faculty and as administration to make sure that that, um, that that really gets conveyed. We're trying to, we're experimenting. We don't know what the best mechanism is for doing that because we all get enough emails and, you know, so we're, we're trying to find, find new ways to, but if people have suggestions, I mean, that's, we're certainly be open to that. to that really quickly. Yeah, I personally, <laughs> okay, so, so short. <laughs> I personally experienced that at the scientific lab for here in Kirkho, where scientists or researchers will come in and needs how they actually can't work on designing this because of whatever deficit they have in transportation. They need help with that to, to design something for them from the ground up, whether it's basic or complicated, and then to be completely excluded from that process and go on service or only to a friend or something from a drawing is extremely frustrating because I, I just put it actually. A completely a facilitated research in a, in a way that just was not measurable. Yeah, please. I, I, so I would be the culture of that sort of needs to change. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I wasn't dismissing that because that is a problem just generally in research with where people get left off of things where they should clearly be acknowledged. One quick question here from Klaus and then we'll move on to the next presenter. Uh, just uh, to add something, I think um, to a certain point it's on the glass floor. The glass floor has to do marketing for themselves, and as well on a on a financial level of marketing, keep your numbers. When you're repairing something, write down what you how much money you save. If you're involved in a project like I was in Princeton, write down what you did. If you have the data, you can spread them. If there are no data, nobody can help you. So that's definitely on the glass floor to provide everybody with the data they need. Data certainly. I have, I have to add to that. I think that's absolutely valid. In, in an institution where you're also being held responsible for generating reimbursable funding, you're actually being penalized for doing it the off, re, off reimbursable work. You have this challenge where you have to balance that. And if you're actually doing outreach, that's taking time away. Yeah. It's not paper, so so it's a constant struggle. And I've actually been in that exact scenario, and then ultimately penalized for doing outreach, which was to get more funding. So I agree with that. It's, it's going to be really difficult. Sorry, I meant. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Thank you. Happy that we've hit ignition temperature. The conversation's starting. I would like to save a little bit of time for the end uh, for additional Q and A. So I, I see you back there. Uh, and now for something completely different, we're coming in from another angle. So far, we've heard from glass blowers that are employed at research facilities. This is Ron Beeler, who's uh, director of research and development for Precision Glass, an outside company that has a significant reputation nationally, maybe globally. Uh, and a very large glass shop as well, so from private industry. Yeah, I'm coming in from a completely different angle. Um, the topic's been kind of shifting a little bit, but it still fits into what I was kind of pre prepping on. So we, we're the instrument side. Bands had one little thing supporting instrumentation. That, that is us. Uh, we make ICB torches for ICB mass spec and just regular ICB instruments. We make a tremendous number of, number of torches. My employee count right now, I'm just under 60 people. I think I've got 28 glass blowers. I can never quite keep track. It, it ebbs and flows a little bit. We would, I'd hire three more tomorrow if I had. So, I mean, that, that tells you the scale and how busy we are at the moment. We, we are, like I say, it's growing, but the instrumentation market it is absolutely huge. COVID made a big difference. Um, we make instrumentation. For glassware for that. We also make it for ultra pure water, some of the little reaction cells and things like that, that, that's the kind of products we make. It went absolutely nuts. But what's interesting about it is all these technologies came out of universities. ICP, that originally was done at university level in the past. Almost everything we are doing, you know, for us as an industry, we can't afford to design a new product. It, it, it's incredibly expensive. I have a great staff. I mean, 
Our glass floors are top notch and some of the things we do, but I'm expensive. If you come in to me, I want XYZ part, I'm not really sure what I need, I'm gonna need it to be tweaked the next week, things like that. That's not our skill set. Anytime I have a chance, I'm like, you guys have a university shop, go to them. It, it makes way more sense. They're more affordable. I mean, I've worked with Joe Breger in the, in the past. He's had projects that have gone on, gosh, over a year. We've been instrumental in helping him. We will do parts that he could not do. We did some machining operations or you know, we, we can work up to 350 millimeter glass. Those are things we can do as an assistant basis, but we are not doing the R&D. We can't really do that. We can't afford to do it. Um, we also make some very high quality optical cells and things like that, laser optics. Again, we end up doing more engineering than we like, but we have to put the onus back onto the customer and what, what do you guys need? We do not have the staff, I don't have the personnel to make that happen. So to put a different level on this, the university class floor is incredibly important. Um, you've got um, not just universities, you've got the national labs, You've got a lot of places. It, it's an area that's been dying over the years. And you guys need to sell yourselves because something that's done in a university, like say, I'm going to charge four to five times. Um, I just had a conversation with Kevin T for the other day. He's like, I'm so busy, Ron. Can you quote this customer for this job? We came back. Um, we were actually four times the price he was going to charge within university. Now, again, it's not something you buy from Ken class, but it is some custom. And for us to do, it's not practical. So again, you guys need to really, really look at those avenues industry-wise. We don't, we're not going to try to take it away from them. I mean, I've heard always the stories about Ken Glass, you know, they're coming in and taking over the universities. Well, one of the problems is, is these universities are not communicating very well. Ken Glass can do it. Number one, they may not be cheaper, especially if you count it in the long run. Number two, you guys can make the tweaks that Ken Glass isn't going to be willing to do. And I love Ken Glass. They have a great product. They make great support for the glass floor. But again, it, it's kind of this false thing. I've talked to Dave Serta about this over the years. And I think at one point they did try to come into the glass shops. But honestly, if the glass shop is marketing themselves properly, and that, that's where I'm trying to sell you guys on, market, these are things I can do here. Yes, you might, you might be able to buy this catalog glass floor. But again, that's not a sustainable solution. Having that person on site is really the benefit. Yeah, you might save 10 bucks on doing this part than me doing it. But guess what? When you need something specialized, if you've got rid of this glass shop, you're going to pay 100 times more money than what that part, what you're saving at this point in time. So again, marketing, marketing, marketing. Make sure you guys know what you guys can offer, that service that you're producing. Like I say, universities, they get credibility. We were talking about the competition to get the paper out first. We, we still are dealing with that as well on the support side of the stuff. And that's, that's what makes the universities tick, selling yourselves as having a glass shop internally. Um, Jim Merritt was one of the best ones I ever heard. He, he, he was the one that's everybody's talking about. They're having to justify their job. He's like, oh no, my university sells the glass shop as a benefit for the professors or the staff coming in they're trying to hire. And he says it has done incredibly well over the years. It's never been a discussion when he was there was it USC, is that right? Southern Cal. So, you know, it, again, it's it's somehow can you flip, how can you flip that table around to, hey, this is such a benefit, this is like having a machine shop at a university or different areas that are supporting it, but it, it's so much more capable than what you can do. But, you know, like I say, speaking on the industry side, I see what you guys have created. I see you guys have the time to do it. Um, we used to have Hans Rohr as part of this society and stuff like that. He's still around, by the way, but um, he made some optical sets. Well, he, guess what? He had time to weld the seam. You know, two to three hours really working out that to make it out really nice. I can't do that. I cannot afford those kind of times. The customer's not going to pay my $100, $120 an hour to go through that, where that university that having that class floor on staff is so much less expensive when it comes down to you need different specialized parts. After that, you know, then it hits industry and then I make money. But you know, I mean, up to that point, I really depend on you guys to make that happen and sell your value. <laughs> Questions from Ron? <laughs> yeah. Where do you primarily market yourself? Do you use social media or where, if you, 
because uh, I myself am a glass artist, so I use uh, Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in a university shop, uh, where do you begin to look for these resources, or where can you market yourself? That's a great question. I unfortunately I'm not in that setting, so I can't tell you. Um, and every media is going to be a little bit different every place. I do know when Joe Greger at one point in time he sat down to part time, and he's talking. He's going for the different labs and saying, "Hey, you guys, you go to the shop." Hey, what can I help you do with this? And making himself, making his face known. And I think that's probably the most valuable thing you can do. I, I'm not going to say Instagram isn't the right way to do it. I really don't know on that one. Uh, Question over here, Klaus. Yeah. I have the last one to answer. Um, that, that has to be locally. You have to do that inside your institution. You have to use all the channels you have. You have to use your, your customers coming in, like um, um, Aaron said. Or over there, I'm not sure that I can the name. Um, so that just um, use you mul um, use them as multipliers. That um, that your that your that your that the necessity of glass growth will be recognized by by administration and publication. Mm -hmm. Glass doors mm -hmm. can do publication as well. Mm -hmm. There's no law that we are not allowed to publish anything. Right. Or that. I, I just kind of like to add, um, I, I am my own owner, a business owner, so is Eric, um, not university based. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of focus on university where some of the universities get really busy. Where, where single man shops like Eric's and myself can still have a boy, it's like, I designed to still have one of my customers. Mm -hmm. Like, just because I got to talk directly with the cabinets. So, there, it cuts the red tape, it cuts all that. And it's more communicating directly with your customer base. So, I mean, if, if University shops are too busy to handle it. You think there is other shops that, that would love that work to do, would love to stay in business. Yep. And you could use that, use the support of these outside shops to keep your university job and everything else secure. Yeah, you get too busy. Like I say, I, like I say I've done work for Joe Greger, I've done it for Bob Singer, I've done tons of different works just to support what they're doing. Again, use your expertise and networking. That's why you come to these events. It's the networking. There's always advice, different things you can pick up from different people. And get those skill sets. I mean, the last of Bell Seals right now. We've been working with Victor Nunn on trying to get that done. And, and again, these are these things. I know Victor very well. He's helping us out. Again, but that networking, and it's going to help a university setting. You can make yourself more capable. Okay, I may not know how to do that, but man, I, I know Ron. I'll, let me give him a call real quick. And most of us will, are more than willing to help you guys out. And if you can't do it, then you may end up farming out a small piece of it. That's what we hope for. But again, it, it's more in our interest to keep this industry going, to keep the glass blowers employed, to keep this research going. I, I personally feel we need to keep it in the United States, and but you know, or at least to some level there, not off, offshoring all of this product and different knowledge. The knowledge is what keeps this country strong. And, and keeps it going, in my opinion. <laughs> Two more questions over here, Jack, and then Tracy. Um, it's actually an interjection with respect to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I ran for a number of years at research programs at labs. And my work was on a campus, not a university, but an industrial corporate campus. 2,500 people. And the distinction is for the labs that we had, we made them so they were very, very capable labs, but a lot of people didn't know about that. So our methodology was two things. One, we started out with nothing more than a brochure flyer to tell people about, and we handed these flyers out to different departments. The second thing we did was is we published progress or accomplishments done for those labs specific items that was put out, you know, like through media. This caused a response and we were able to get people in who said, we didn't even know these labs were here and they're so capable. The other aspect I want to bring up in respect to what we were, all of you were doing is glass blowers. You might seriously want to consider also uh, the addition of 3D glass printing and put that as part of your nomenclature and learn that and understand that. In MEMS devices and these types of technologies, glass printing is going to become common, and it has been progressing. 
And then you can apply the technologies that will be further advancing for glass application. If you take 20 students who know nothing about glass, glass blowing, or glass printing, and say, which one, which, which class would you like to take? 80% of them are going to go for glass printing because they're familiar with that in terms of the concept, not so much the application. But all of you could reciprocate those two together, meaning in respect to one would fall off or work with the other in terms of showing you here's what you can do with printing, here's what you can't do with printing, here's what you can do with blowing that you can't do with, you know. And you would find that to be dynamic, I think, in time if you incorporate this and institute this methodology for a future. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Tracy. I just wanted to state the obvious. We have a bunch of students, but I want to consider the American Chemical Society. You asked what you could do to introduce yourself to, you know, talking about cold calling universities. Going in through the local section of the American Chemical Society is another avenue. I just wanted to. Thank you, Rob. Ben. So uh, at this point, I'd like to pivot back again, and we'll go back to the uh, more academic side. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Lee Sharp from Grinnell College. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ben, for. <laughs> Both a faculty member and a glass blower at Grinnell College. Um, and the way I came to this is I, I learned glass blowing as an undergraduate. And so um, back at Ripon College, the inorganic chemist was a glass blower. He made um, neon signs, he was really good at it, um, and he offered a class. And so I learned some of that. I went on to the University of Wisconsin Madison, and Charlie uh, offered a class. Um, I took that, I learned more, um, and it was through these classes that I learned what you can do with glass and, and all the options and to not be limited with the ACE catalog, that there's so much more you can do. And so when I became uh, a professor at, at Grinnell, I immediately went to see Peter uh, and said, I need a, vac a, a high vacuum line. I need to go to 10 to the minus six. I need these various ports. I need a diffusion pump pressure gauge, all the various things. And as assistant professor, I didn't have time to do that. So I really needed the glass floor to build that for me. But once it's installed, it's not, you know, a student, undergraduates are not very coordinated. It's the first time they work here. They were breaking the ports off that thing all the time. This is not something I wanted to take down and bring over and have it fixed. So the ability for me to go through it and repair it, and fix that port or these, you know, things that are are difficult or impossible to move was really helpful. And just, you know, having experience with the training in glass forming, you know, it's just, you know, expanded what I can do in my own research and has really informed the kinds of projects and supported things that I couldn't do, have done without it. And so that I gave a talk yesterday uh, and the, the, the sort of centerpiece that allowed me to do this research was this new glass sprayer I was able to build this that's adjustable because I had those skills and knew that I could do that sort of thing. And so I think my advice to you is to offer a glass warning to students. Uh, I know when I offered it for now, I can't do it all the time, but when I do, there, I have more students interested than I can possibly take. We have six torches, and so that's kind of it. And Ben just come over and, and, and work with my students so they can see how it's actually really done. <laughs> but we go through, um, through a semester being two hours a week on a Friday afternoon, um, I find that you have to play Baroque music while the glass point, less injuries, if you tell music. They whine a lot, so we played rock and roll once, and <laughs> will burn themselves and cut themselves, all of that kind of stuff. No back to world music. Um, I'm kinder than my professor was, because uh, what he would do as a, the undergraduate trainer, uh, you build something, and the way you test it, you see, look at it, and start whacking it against the counter. And it was how hard he could hit it against the counter for it broke. And well, that was pretty good. <laughs> and in fact, it's like, 
But anyway, there's lots of interest in, in students to take glass blowing. I know my uh, oldest son is at a university that does not have a glass blower, and in R1 University, um, and he ran into a situation where he needed a very specific double junction all glass electrode that he could put in a very specific device, not available, and, and had to come to me as a liberal arts teacher, a small liberal arts college in the Midwest to build this for 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 him. And so it's just it, to me, it's difficult to think about Grinnell College without a glass blower. I can't imagine an R1 university without a glass blower without having somebody to go talk to. So when I was designing the back line, when I did, had a, uh, Peter build me a still, it was very unique things I needed. It was not available, but because I knew, had enough glass blowing experience, I knew that these things were capable. What could be done with glass, even though I couldn't build that still or, or that back line. Um, my son at Purdue, uh, youngest son, uh, is a glass blower there. May he be here? Ah, there you go. He was not able to sign up for the class, but he's interested. It filled before he could, but again, you know, that class filled completely, and there's still people waiting to get in. So there, there's lots of student interest in, and I, there might be a little bit concern that you're going to have students do their own glass blowing and not come to you. But believe me, we're going to mess it up. We're not good enough. Glass blowing is really a challenge. You guys are experts at this, and we'll try it, screw it up, and then come to you. Uh, and, and you'll do it right, but we'll know what can be done. And so I, I think that's the biggest thing to encourage. Um, and then just for, you know, as Scott had pointed out, recruiting, I mean, I tell students when they're looking at graduate programs, you need to look at universities that have shops, the glass shop, the electronic shop, the machine shop, because those things have really enabled me to do cutting edge research, not just what you can get out of a catalog. I mean, the idea of, telling the synthetic chemist that you can only work with chemicals you can buy from Signal Ulrich and you can't do anything else, I mean, that's insane. Um, you've got to be able to build your own stuff, to make your new molecules, to make your new apparatus. So, thank you. A somewhat unique situation, because the faculty who also built his own class. Plus, I want to thank you for that analogy. That's that's really that's really um, yeah that, that's very helpful in the next for the next conversation. My can was only from this way. Thank you. Uh, question in the court. Uh, yeah, you talked about like you know understanding what can be done just by simple experience and everything. But on the glass blower side, from like knowing okay, university or industrial scientific class going, like what can be done versus what is there to be done? I, as a glass blower, I, I work at both sides in, in Milwaukee, and uh, like we specialize in cryogenic doers and molecular stills, and like doers have been around for a very long time. The molecular still design has been refined since like the 1940s. But that's what we do, and I'm also not a chemist. I don't have a chemistry degree. I just understand what they taught me in school, in high school, enough to say, okay, this is what my class is making. But it's it's also really hard to understand oh, what's what glassware needs to be made from the glassware, the glassblower's point of view, without the chemist. And it's not to say that the glassblower needs to meet doesn't need it's more like we need more of that like scientific this is what people are working on and understanding those avenues ourselves really yeah and, i mean and what ben just done bringing the acs and american glass mm -hmm. society together at these means having you guys go to talks that the chemists are giving and see what is the apparatus they're using and Gee, I can do that better. <laughs> you know, if we could put, you know, modify or something, I think that's a really good way to learn that. Thank you. Uh, there's a question over here. Um, I'll be real brief. I want to piggyback on something you said. Any of us that were, I'm retired from the university. It's been a while. Um, if you, if you're a class at any university, pressure your administration, your department to let you teach a class. 
It's very, very important. We talked about Charlie, you know, showing you some things that I knew Charlie very well. He's, he's a good friend. I took his job in Notre Dame. Um, one of his students applied for a job somewhere. There was a whole group of people applying for this job, and she got the job because she walked past and said, that's broken. How come it's broken? We don't have a vegetable. She said, well, I could fix that. She got the job because she took his class. I ran into a young lady today. Uh, I can find young because she's got fewer gray hairs than I do. <laughs> she took my class 20 years ago. And now she's teaching it at her university and pressuring them to hire a full time law school. So get this knowledge out. I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but if you work someplace that you don't, you're not allowed to teach, figure out a way to do it at any level. Share your information with the undergraduates and graduate students. It does pay off. It pays off big time for our profession going down the road. Not going to help me. I, I stand my garage and work on business cars now. So. But <laughs> push that because it's very important. And that, that, that story about Charlie, I forgot the lady's name. He was very excited that she got her job because of that two credit or three credit or one credit course that he taught. So it is important. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Sharp. So we have a, a couple of minutes left yet. I know I left one question hanging uh, kind of at the beginning of, of the hour. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, so questions for any of the panelists? I guess from, from a chemical standpoint, or from some of the doctors in the room, or some of the chemical professional. Um, what is your single greatest resource for like where do you look for your chemistry knowledge? Because what we struggle with the ASGS is where to advertise. Where where to put our money for our advertising? And do you guys have a source that you look for your chemical knowledge on not just in one university setting, kind of in an overall setting that you would say would be beneficial for the ASGS to focus their efforts? CNN News. Thank you. I have the same thing written down. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, from this regional meeting, it's quite possible we could possibly report at CNN News and have just a brief report of this meeting of these two groups. That's the kind of thing that they would love to have. Oh. It could be a short paragraph. Are you listening, Ben? Catherine's already talked to him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Again? table for the, the ACS side of this meeting is right upstairs. That's four professional staff from ACS. Okay. So some of those people, Tori, Tori knows more. I'm the, the... Yeah. Dr. Jackson? Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to jump in there and say um, on the front page for the Midwest Regional Meeting is uh, a link to a little interview piece that I did um, a few weeks ago with chemical and engineering news with a very uh, fine uh, journalist called Ari Rennell and um, I think that we could probably facilitate something through that connection um, and by the way that interview did also flag this meeting um, and this event. Thank you. Yeah. Now I would offer a suggestion from the other side, from the chemist side, uh, how do you find a glass blower? The American Center of Glass Blower Society has a website, and there is a drop-down menu there that says "Find a Glass Blower." And these are people that are members of the American Center of Glass Blower Society. There are a lot of people out there that, that choose not to be, but if you're looking for an opportunity to connect with someone who can make glass equipment for you that has some level of vetting, you know, some standard peer review of some sort or another, that would be a really good place to start. Uh, and there's contact information there for people all over the country as well as in Canada. So potentially uh, we can do more in terms of outreach. Yeah, uh, that's worth mentioning. Aaron and then Klaus. Regionally uh, arranged. So you're talking about more in your area. Right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And Klaus? And on top, now you could find international class stores if any scientist is leaving um, this country. And going to Germany, you'll find um, the international members of the ASGS in there as well. 
And then there's a German counterpart. So. And French. Yeah. And British. And, and Japanese. Yeah. Together, um, yeah. Just a short, very short story. Austrian scientists came to Germany in my workshop, said, hey, I need some work somewhere. I would do something. I said, I can do that. Now I learned that. He said, where? In Princeton. I said, oh, my Sousa. I said, where do you know that? So mm -hmm. we have the glass doors try to to keep up um, of the needs of, of the scientists just to be up to date to know what is happening all over this planet. So I want to uh, spin the direction again just a little bit. We're talking about what's happening currently and moving forward. But if you'd like to know more about this interrelationship between chemists and glassblowers, we have a chance to have a little bit of a historical retrospective. Um, and there'll be a talk presented tonight by Dr. Jackson. And I want to give you a chance to pitch that. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> Your salesman, Eric. <laughs> Let's see if I'm a salesman too. Um, it's really great to be here. I, I know many of the people in the room, um, at least by face. I'm better at faces than names, so if, if you guys think I should know your name, but I look like I don't, um, just give me a helping hand. Um, so it is great to be back um, at the ASGS Midwest. It's particularly great to be here at this unique event. Um, so this afternoon at 5.30, um, Tracy Dreyer and I are going to be presenting the closing plenary. Um, any of you who were in Austin at the ASGS National Meeting, totally new talk, more about the history of scientific glass blowing, title, Micro Heterotopias, Chemistry Meets Glass Blowing, and um, this talk is a talk that is hitting all of all of those notes around engaging chemists, junior chemists, student chemists with what glass blowers can do. We're using history to be able to do some very straight talking about the importance of the relationship between chemistry and glass blowing. It's a nice thing you can do with history that's a lot harder to do when you're in the now, right? So yes, it is coming from the past, but we are very much targeted at now and going forward in terms of helping people who are coming through chemistry training to understand what it is that you guys have to offer. So please do be, be there. Bring all your family and friends. It'll be awesome. Tracy's got some lovely demonstrations for you. And you'll learn what we mean by micro-heterotopias. Thanks so much. <laughs> challenge is that it won't be in this building. Uh, we have to go to a new location. Can you help us out? How do you, where will this? I can, I can actually uh, provide some Perfect. Yeah. Um, so Good. it's going to be over in the chemistry building and we are going to try to help people get over there. So I have a few volunteers that are going to help lead people across because um, it's, you got to go through downtown and just across campus. It's like a five minute walk, but we'll make sure everybody gets over there. So is the glass shop in that room? For any glass that information is on the ASGS. So, so you know, even, like, so that's a short walk, right? So, yeah. it's 10 minutes. Like, instructions on the ASGS. Oh, so <laughs> Thank you for this hour. I can really feel the, the curiosity and interest. Uh, and in closing, what I want to do is encourage you, don't end the conversation uh, in, in the next 20 seconds. But if you happen to see one of us wandering around in a dazed, confused manner, uh, talk to us uh, as glassblowers. And glassblowers, if you see someone with an ACS badge on, go up to them and talk to them. This should be the beginning of the conversation, not the only conversation that happens. We must move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so with that, we do have an opportunity for a break, a much needed break. So we will. It's all good, thank you. No, <laughs> no, <laughs>
the speaker was here versus in front of the microphone necessarily. I didn't think about that. This is a pretty good microphone for catching everything in front of it. Yeah. Very little behind it. Is this still directional? Directional. Yes. Yeah. 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 Huh? We need to announce Anybody need to ride? I have a car. What's this called? 15 to 30. But it stays up until 10. What is Provo? Not very cool place. I don't know. Asian infusion. What? It's fine. It's fine. Apparently, they're not. I was nice. pretending to be snooty about oh. or, like, I live in Fargo. Oh, okay. True, yeah, you're <laughs> I was talking to some people in one of the Dakotas about you, right. and because I'm like, oh, well, you do have a glass bar in the Dakotas, and I didn't remember if you lived in North or South. North, buddy, all the way. No, we like it on top. Right. We like it on top. Are you practically in Canada? Uh, sort of. He's practically in Minnesota. I'm more okay. in Minnesota than I'm in Canada. Yes. We're right on the river. I can, I can like throw a rock in Minnesota. Oh, nice. So, yeah, we're really on the board. Literally, the whole city is on like a hemisphere on the board. Okay, well, so 4.30 is here, then 5 is over there. Uh, 5.30. Well, we'll be done here at five. So we'll over here at five, yeah, five, it's five, four o'clock here. I'm trying to debate if I want to walk over in these shoes. It's four o'clock here. I and mean, then, I wouldn't, yeah. but I wouldn't be wearing shoes like that to begin with. Here in my Crocs. Crocs. <laughs> I mean, you're in Crocs and it's, you rock it. So I wish I could have worn Crocs. I would be wonderful. Have you seen these? What? I'll take these at this brand. Oh, shoes. my partner has them, the dude shoes, yeah. and he got them at like a. Yeah, at the main, and I guess like some kid was saying how they're old man shoes. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'll wear it. I wear old man underwear. Oh, it's just not, so funny because he was just like, are these not cool? <laughs> <laughs> but they're comfortable. No, they're like, well, the thing is, they're so lightweight. Yeah. They're way nothing. Okay. So there's like, I don't get my usual uh, leg fatigue. I'm joking, but like, they're really lightweight. They're so lightweight. And I relatively heard, inexpensive. Yeah. Like, like I, a product. Um, I work, I wear this brand called Allegria. They're actually like nursing shoes. Yeah. But I can stand all day in them, which is really nice. It's normally normal shoes I can't stand all day in. Props I can. It's what I live in when I'm not at work. Yeah. They're not really um, acceptable glass only shoes. Yeah. Well, this might get you. Hiking boots at work, so. <laughs> Those are heavy, you know? Like, yeah, but they feel nice and my feet don't get wet. I hate having wet feet yeah. and wet hands. I'm like a cat. They, here's why I think they're similar. They have the spongy. Uh, audio? Uh, I have no idea. I don't know. We can test it. I'm not gonna, I don't want to sneak in his backpack. He stole everything from us. So, 
that was important. Not that in this case, being having data, it was not the first person of national team, but it's strong things were going on the other side of the people. And I'm saying that was weird. And the training was so
Steve Anderson, last floor of Mayo Clinic. With predominantly Steve Anderson. Predominantly, okay. Predominantly <laughs> Steve Anderson. Could, could we do the uh, projection? Oh, could we? Uh, <laughs> well, while we get that going, let me, let me introduce myself. I'm Kevin Bennett. Um, I uh, am now at Mayo Clinic, and I've been at Mayo Clinic for, well, I was going to be there for two years, a special project. It's been 32 years. I never met. <laughs> And I'm still employed, and I'm trying to figure out how to get out of there. So, um, <laughs> we still need that. Sorry. Okay. So, um, my glass blowing interest started when I was a kid. I wanted a laser, and at that point in time, you couldn't buy lasers; you had to make them. And so, you know, the Scientific American um, in the back of the magazine was, um, let's see, that's all. Mm -hmm. But we're still not projecting. Okay. I'll let you refocus on that. After. So anyway, I burned my fingers a lot, and eventually <laughs> we created a linear uh, laser. And my father comes down in the basement to see what in the devil I'm doing. And he says, well, if you can do that, you can fix my barometers. So he was a meteorologist, and he collected antique barometers. And so most of the tubes were broken. And they always are, right? And so that's when I sort of expanded okay, started making those. And I had a summer job in, as, as a high school kid. That I made more money doing barometer repair in Washington, D.C. than I probably even make now. That was just <laughs> an incredible thing to do. So, um, since then, I'm the uh, senior administrator and past chair of the Division of Engineering and Panel. And so we have a staff of 67 uh, engineers and technologists, and the glass shop is a part of that division. And so, over the years, it's been an interesting fight because well, I've changed up my uh, presentation a little bit to, to talk more about what we've just been talking about, is that I was able to transition from being a research laboratory that had to pay for itself to be part of an administrative overhead so that we get an allocated budget allocation each year. Now, the challenge is that I have to go around and make sure everybody thinks we're doing such an incredible job, we get the next piece of money. And it has worked fine for my 22 years, of the 20 years, um, and the division has been around since like 1950, and so it's very much an integral part of, of that. So some other things about how to keep the glass shop going, because we've always got people sniffing around trying to figure out how to put us out of business or reduce our budget and things of that nature. And so one of the things that um, we strive to do is make sure the glass door was a part of everyone's life. And so every time we had an opportunity to do a presentation, every time we had a, a time to, to show our work, um, what you got here on your um, uh, tables, our brochure and uh, a presentation that the libraries actually sponsored. And since we have three locations, we, we actually have 60,000 employees, but we've got three locations and so it's a traveling show. And so people see what the glass blowers can do. Okay. Um, also what we try to do is give trainings. So there was an IT show in which, I'm not sure exactly what software it was, they were demonstrating giving away these little little squishy fish. They're about that big. And you know, you could squeeze them, yes. And so I snuck one out, we got it over to Steve Anderson, he put it in a glass bottle, of course with a hole so small you couldn't possibly get it in. And we had it in the booth next to these folks. And so they weren't looking at, people weren't coming to look at that fish, they were looking at our fish. 
And so we ended up actually selling it to the IT people. Um, for whenever you get your materials in a publication, ask for acknowledgement. Bottom for bottom of the entire article, your name, what you did, always works. Uh, we've had some interaction with the CEO. Um, for some reason, they have bought a Chihuly sculpture. I mean, this thing is huge. Okay. Um, and I think it looks like a bad spirochete infection is what they're <laughs> But nonetheless, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that cost. Okay, and so that CEO that got that in was retiring. So Steve made a mini Chihuly. It was only about this big, an idea to put it on his Christmas tree. We got more mileage out of that than you could ever imagine. So, um, videos, we've done a few of those, internal videos, so people can find us. We'll give tours to everybody, especially the administrative staff and the secretary staff. Because a couple of months ago, um, we got a call from the current CEO because they had a problem. A major donor was coming to town, but they didn't have a gift. And so, two secretaries and three administrators holding the call us. And we showed up and we were able to solve the problem. So, with that, uh, let me get more into some of the thoughts. So um, the other thing that I try to do is give people little vignettes, people, um, people information about glass. Because people like stories. They want to talk about things. And so we want them to talk about the glass shop. And you know, there's glass we all know. It's been around for you know, 3,600 years. The stuff is still usable. I mean, it's amazing. If you had a metal bowl or a cup or something like that, it's not going to be. But glass survives. survives. Um, you know, it's naturally occurring when we talk about the age of the universe, the historic, you use glass and knives. You still use them, especially in ophthalmology. They're the sharpest things you can get. Um, the characteristics, uh, light transmission, microwave transmission, temperature resistance, chemical resistance, formability, all this sort of stuff. And it has been glass, then glass volume has been decreasing because of plastics and other things of that nature. But nothing else can do what we can do with glass. I guess let's go to the, the bottom. I've been unable to identify anything that's an article of commerce that doesn't have glass in it. All the semiconductors, you know, food, anything, we're a part of it. And so that's a story that you, you, can, uh, you can share. Uh, the replacement by plastics, it only works in certain cases. Um, raw material, you know, it's the most abundant. Two elements in the world when we talk about um, silica glasses. Um, and so, from that perspective, uh, you know, it's recyclable, it's the ultimate packaging. But let's get more into some of the innovations that we find in Maine. So, um, the glass shop has been in the since uh, 1925? 20, 1920. Okay, in fact, that's on the next slide. Um, but we've got 5,500 patents issued and 2,600 licenses, and the glass shop certainly has been a part of every one of them. But it is an integral part of the organization. And we find every day, like all you do, to make sure that people recognize that. That is, that is the, one of the takeaways. Um, at Mayo, we discovered cortisone, spawned many drugs. We made a mistake and gave it to Merck. They said, thanks, but we haven't seen a dime. They've done very well. Uh, heart lung machine uh, for cardiac bypass, first one in, uh, in the world that actually worked. Uh, MRI scanner, the software that was developed in Mayo is in every MRI scanner, or they're not competitive. Now, how did that happen? All sorts of phantoms, they were made out of glass and made out of plastic. And that's how they used to, to certify the, the software. Um, Arab digestive screening system, I'm sure you've seen advertisements for them that uh, had some glass components in it. Uh, neurosurgical devices for deep brain stimulation, uh, the electrodes, and I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. And many others. I mean, we're, we're everywhere. So here's the glass shop. So this gentleman, gentleman Harry Nunnemaker, uh, 1925, yeah. uh, predated us all. Harry was here for 44 years. Yeah. Right? Um, Gordy, which I think all of you know, and wasn't here, 33. And when Steve came and said, Steve's got to be 22 years, we just came out of here. <laughs> so, Steve, how many years has it been? 23. 23, and yeah, he's talking about it. Okay. So some devices that Steve has been involved in are made, invented, and other people. Uh, this is kind of an interesting training device for heart catheterization, because if you look at this, here's the heart, and here's the main, main veins and arteries. 
And the problem we've got is we have to teach students how to catheterize without really being able to see what they're doing. I mean, we can give them an x-ray, but that's a 2D representation of the 3D world, and they got to figure it out. Well, if you use this, you can see what's going on when you're guiding the catheter, and you can see it on the tree. And so it has been pretty useful. This is one aortic valve recellularization vessel. And so in terms of heart valves, some people have that replacement heart valves. There are heart valves that are mechanical, there are heart valves that are uh, biologic based. Um, the mechanical ones will be out of pyrolytic carbon. Uh, they will last the lifetime of the patient. Pyrolytic carbon is non thrombogenic, it is just great stuff, but it clicks. And so you can hear somebody's done out of that place. They don't like it. <laughs> the other is that it can't grow or modify with the person. So if you take a pig valve, um, you can tan it, so you can put it in the leather, and then you it can implant it. And it works pretty well, but it doesn't work pretty well. And so the idea is, why don't we take a pig valve, take the cells off of it, and then put human cells back on, and then it can repair itself. And so this is the device that's made out of glass that does it. Phantom for imaging uh, colonoscopy. Uh, probably looking around the room, probably a lot of you have had colonoscopies at this point. It's not the most pleasant thing in the world. Notice the laughter, like people that haven't, something to look forward to. So the idea is, let's see if we can do this with other imaging modalities. And so, but what you have to do is you have to know what's in there. <clears throat> and so Steve developed the device that actually has known things in it. And so when you get your images, you know whether you got the right answer. <clears throat> This is um, modeling of aneurysms. So there's a fair number of people that get enlargements of either aortic aneurysms near the heart or aneurysms in the brain. If it's aortic, you can get to it, and many times you can repair it, and they're going to be okay. If it's in the brain, you're kind of, it's not uncertain, you are out of line. You can't get down into the brain to repair this thing without destroying so much of the brain that the person isn't going to survive. And so the research is. How is it happening? What's going on? Because humans are the lucky animal that gets aneurysms. Not, not, none of the other animals do. So we are very fortunate there. We're, we're really like rats because we do most of the experimentation with rats and we learn from there and it actually works with people. Aneurysms, not so much. Doesn't work. And so what Steve would get is he would get the imagery uh, of the brain, of the aneurysm, he get multiple views of it. We'd print a 3D model of it, and then Steve would bake it out of glass. And the reason is that if it's out of glass, we can see what's going on in the flow um, by, here you can see a model, and you can see the relief here. But if you use an index refracting media, you can make it disappear. And so what you do is you put particles in the fluid that's inside, nothing on the outside, and you use laser uh, Doppler and now you can figure out the pressures and flows inside the aneurysm. And it has absolutely amazed all our physicians about how accurate Steve is able to make the aneurysm. That, that you look at it, you look at the image, and eventually you look at a, uh, the actual thing. It's the same. And so from that, we can get a much better understanding of what's happening, why the, the uh, aneurysms expand, and what we can do inside. Because we can get in there, and we can put coils of platinum wire, we can put other things in there to try to clot off the sac. And if you can clot off the sac, then the blood flow continues and you're fine. But each aneurysm is different. Sometimes the vasculature is very, very complex. So uh, tissue bath, this is one in which uh, we study cardiac tissue and I think other tissues. It's cardiac and what other state? GI. GI, okay, gastric tissue. And so the idea is that down here is you have a piece of tissue. And get to it, you can see it. Okay? It's open at the top, so you put electrodes down here and see what's happening electrically within the tissue. But you've got to keep it alone. So what you have is you have uh, your fluid that fills this area. You have a water jacket, and what the water jacket does is keeps this fluid warm, body temperature. And then you've got to create circulation, and you do that by adding oxygen here that bubbles up and oxygenates the media and creates a flow. And Steve has had to make 
so many of these. We send them around the world because this is something that Mayo has figured out how to do um, and nobody else really has. And I use this as an example when people come to visit. Say, look, you can't make that out of plastic. You can make it out of metal, but it's worthless. It doesn't do you any good. It doesn't work. Um, and so glass blowing is the only way you're going to be able to do that. Even if you 3D printed something, if it's plastic, it's not going to work very well. You're going to leach out all the materials that are in the plastic that you're using, and it's going to do something to the cells. So we try to find this thing as a, a bench in this, in this lab with all sorts of interesting things. So when we bring people for tours, we can engage them with what the value is of glass ball and why it's a vital interest today to our patients. And so that's where we draw our strength from, is that the usual term of the Mayo is the needs of the patient come first. That's not exactly the quote that the Mayo brothers use, but pretty close to use it. And so whenever we're doing something or we're funding, we talk about the needs of the patient and how we're supporting physicians and how we're supporting research, but it's the patients. That's why we're here. So um, this was a, a picture that I you know, found in Corey Smith, and I thought I'd show it because that's the best dressed glass blower I have ever seen. <laughs> so um, I think we're coming up coming up on time here. So what I wanted to do is uh, talk about a um, project that, that I spend a lot of time on, and this is one of the you've been maybe you've probably seen this before. But basically what these are, these are electrodes, 7 microns by about, about 50 microns. Uh, this would be the tip. And so what we're doing is we take these uh, pyrolytic carbon electrodes, carbon fiber, find in your tennis racket, and we put them in an insulated uh, panel, and we put these into the brain. And we started putting them in the brain of mice and other animals, and very recently we have had human trials, and it works pretty well. What we can do with this is we can measure the neurotransmitters that are being created and destroyed within the brain. So we can watch, if you will, how people think, how the brain communicates, <coughs> things of that nature. Now what we need to do is we need to leave these in chronically. So that was this test. So that's day one, that's day three, and day five, there's nothing left. And what happens when we put the electric current on these to take the measurements of the neuro, uh, neurotransmitters what happens is the voltage we have to use is above the dissociation voltage, which creates hydrogen and oxygen in the normal electrolysis apparatus. And so when that happens in the body, the little bit of oxygen is an oxygen radical. It's extremely oxidative and, in effect, burns up the electric. It converts it to carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide, and it goes out through the lungs. And so you can see here, this is, I, I won't. Uh, spend the time with how you can interpret that. We'll teach you that in a little while, but it's not worth it at this point. Um, but basically, these are uh, indications of concentrations of neurotransmitters. And we can pick the conditions we can put on here to pick which neurotransmitter we want to get the readout on. So if we look at the end, you can see how the oxygen is cratering the electric. Here, it's much more uh, severe and it's disappearing. And so we said, okay, that's not going to work. What we want to do is we want, want to put a stimulator, a neurostimulator, in the brain, have a feedback loop, so that let's say we have someone who's depressed. And they are clinically depressed. They're, they're getting in trouble all the time, okay? Because they just can't stand the light. Well, we know how to make people happy. You know where to put the electrode, turn on the electricity, and they are happy. They are so happy that their house could be burning down, but they're still happy. <laughs> so that's not good. So what we want to do is we want to make sure they don't go below some level of dopamine, and we don't want them to go above that level of dopamine, because our bodies servo our dopamine level. And then things happen. OK, some days we're sad, some days we're pretty static. Um, but we don't top out or bottom out. So we need these electrodes to go into the brain so that we can do that for people. And we believe, and there's indication that it's true, that if we do that, people will no longer be depressed, but they will be normal. So that's the goal. But once we put these in, we want them to last for a lifetime of patient. I use the this in 30 years. People are older, but they usually get this. Uh, because you don't want to have to go back in. I mean, we are putting these electrodes about that far down into the brain. And if you do it, and you do it right, you can't feel it. The good part about it is the brain is not dropping. 
So it hurts to get there. So we put light again, stuff like that, drill a hole, and we have a special frame and put the electrodes into the early location. It's really kind of fascinating. Um, and so the problem was, what are we going to use? Because carbon fiber, I really like carbon, which works incredibly well for heart valves. That's a lifetime patient, no problem at all. And so it's got to be carbon containing because it has to be associated with the neurotransmitters. It has to be um, highly oxidation resistant. It has to be electrically conductive, uh, biologically kind of compatible, and we got a few more. Okay. So if you look at that, look at that and say, okay, what is it that could you do that? The only answer we've been able to come up with is diamond. The only problem with diamond is it is not electrically conductive. But if you recall the Hope diamond, 43 and a half carat diamond about this big, uh, it's in the Smithsonian now, it's blue because it's electrically conductive. So the color centers that are produced are caused by free electrons. So you go, okay, we need diamonds. Okay, so we call up and there are people who make diamonds. We tell them what we need, we get a couple, they're careful. They just, they just either fall apart or they don't give us the right answer. So we can't use a natural diamond because most of them are not blue because they're not conducted. And so if you get out your handy dandy you know, diamond synthesis manual, what you'll see is you'll see temperature and you'll see pressure. And you've heard about making diamonds, and typically what you're looking at is you're looking at very high pressure, very high temperature, nickel catalysts, and you can grow diamonds at three rapidly. But you have no control. You're going to get what you get, you sort them out, you cut them up, you sell them as gemstones. Okay. Um, but there's shockwave. Um, the Russians do a lot of that. They've got a lot of surplus explosives, so they blow up carbon, and they come up with nano diamonds, and it makes great grit. Uh, down in here, high pressure, high temperature synthesis. Um, graphite, you get down here. This is metastable, CBD, uh, it doesn't work that well. But down here in this corner, Low pressure, 20 core, and around a thousand degrees, you can make diamond. I said, okay, Steve, let's talk. Okay, so we got Steve, four other people. He said, we, we stood at his whiteboard in his office and said, we need to do diamonds. And we got four weeks. There's another reason why there's four weeks, but it was four weeks. Okay, there it is. So, what we did was came up with this reactor design out of porous silicon. So at this point, uh, okay, so we're gonna flow the gas down through here. Here's a water jacket. Here's a way to look at what's happening. Then we can measure temperature at that point in time. And so Steve made this out of glass. So here's the reactor after we put it all together. And so we have large electrical leads. This is running a filament. It's gonna be at 3000 degrees, hydrogen, uh, methane and trimethyl borane are going to come in here. They're going to be associated by that filament. Right over here, or actually right in the center there, is the spot in which we're going to put electrodes. And we're going to drop the temperature from 3,000 degrees down to about 1,000 degrees. And diamond is going to precipitate out of that stream. Now, the problem is, we also, it's, 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 you get graphite as well as diamond, but we only want the diamond. So we put in a surplus of hydrogen. And when that active hydrogen gets to the graphite that's coming out of the, the stream, it converts it back to methane and off goes. And so we're left with that. And since we put boron in, we're left with boron containing diamond that is electrically conductive. So here it is working. And after the four hours, we got our first diamond. And from here, we're at the batches of eight electrodes uh, per run, runs of boron. And we have been able to demonstrate in animal and in human that we can measure the amount of dopamine, serotonin, and adenosine. And so what we've done is we got the synthesis process patented. We've got a few other patents, and now we're trying to raise money <coughs> so we can actually create a company that can build these things commercially. So here's a um, video. Uh, when we first started that, that research. So Dr. Deep brain stimulation is state-of-the-art neurosurgical technique where an electro gets implanted into the brain. In the case of Parkinson's disease, we can instantly stop that stroke. One of the
greatest challenges that we had was a durable electrode. Our division of engineering came up with the potential solution of using diamonds. These diamonds have very unique properties. And so the division of engineering built us a diamond reactor. We thought about the process and said, we can do this. The members of the team included electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, programmers, glass blowers, a wide variety of, of team members. The team created this reactor in four weeks. We turned it on, and four hours later, we had our first time. So this is the type of video that when you produce this, people want to see it. So, <laughs> so with that, um, I think I am probably right so, questions? Can you go back to the slide? I just really like that picture. Which one? <laughs> this one? This one? Yeah. But why don't you come over here because then, then it won't be. Yeah. It looks Photoshop. Well, it is. Um, I, I did that with my, my phone camera. <laughs> wow. I just awesome. walked up to it and took a picture. Yeah, it must have been a sight to see right there. Do you have an iPhone? Yeah. And so there's a lot that you don't see here about how to make it work because you've got to control the temperatures, you've got to control the pressures, you've got to mix the gases, and so there's actually a lot of secret. So now we're able to do this. So now we really need to make commercial quantities because now we have to do the statistical analysis, we've got to prove you know, what it is, all that. So that reactor is about that big around. And in the equipment is one, two, three, about four by four. Um, it's made out of aluminum. And the reason it's made out of aluminum is that iron poisons the reactor. So if you use stainless steel or iron, it will not work. And uh, so, of course, you know, we need to see. So, what do we do? We put in a glass window. As I said, everything has got glass in it. So, we had a uh, student, a uh, senior, that was working with Star. And I put Alex on this project. And um, you know, my, my memory was that people were pretty happy that, that he was there. He was a real go getter. And so he goes to college and he gives me a call. He says, um, Mr. Kevin, do you, uh, do you think I could build a diamond reactor? And I go, Well, Alex, you were there during the whole thing. I mean, you, you saw how it worked. I go, Okay, probably could. And I go, But why? And he goes, Well, in the dorm, electricity is free. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, you just let this grow, you'll get good sized diamonds. And I said, Well, Alex, as soon as you do that, they're going to notice the electricity consumption has jumped up by at least 50%, and they're going to come looking for somebody growing something. <laughs> One last question, please. Yep. Um, I'm assuming that the diamond is faring better than the carbon fiber. Oh, yes, yes. Um, we, we run it. Like side it we, we can't no, find it. We have not found a failure mode yet. Okay. We've run it for um, uh, only about four months. Okay. But what we do is we ping it with the electricity incredibly fast um, because that stimulates, stimulates a much longer process. Mm -hmm. Because every time you, you run it, you, you're going to get oxygen. Yeah. Um, so we have to Sorry, just real quick. Is the entire electrode diamond? No, we, or is it, we, uh, we do a core. It's, it's a core of tungsten, or an actual core going down is a core of carbon. Because the problem is you need to use things that uh, can be certified to be safe for humans. Okay. But uh, we're, we've only got about four <laughs> microns of diamonds. This is, it's, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Oh. I'm super curious. Is the entire electrode like inside, and do you stimulate that from outside the skull, or? So the, the answer would be it depends. Okay. So if you are doing experiments, you don't bother implanting them in the animals um, because you're going to do experiments fairly quickly. And we've got some great great information on, on drug addiction, which is absolutely amazing. Um, but. Where we're going right now and what we're raising the money for in the company is that we would carve out two, two holes and we put the electronics pack here and the surface of the skull. And then uh, we would have a, a flexible electrode which would have diamond on it and another one that would have platinum ring electrodes. And we place those in the two positions and you know we cover everything up with skin. And so then you would measure the neurotransmitter if it's not what you want, you then put a pulse in, 
to the oh. platinum electrode. Sorry. And so that part is currently a DBS, deep brain stimulation uh, system. And those are commercial. They were invented about 1980. And so they were adding the smart part of it. <clears throat> but right now we're looking at uh, doing some clinical trials in which uh, some of our collaborators have demonstrated that the right spot with the right stimulator, um, doing it blindly, okay. you can take someone who's addicted to heroin and plant this for, you know, it's actually planted for less than two years. As soon as you tune it, turn it on, they, they, the patients report they no longer have craving. They, they're not interested in drugs. They can be in the room with people using drugs, but they don't. After two years, you put it all out, and they don't want drugs. So the problem is, we don't know why. And so that's what we're going to do. But, but this could be half the case. Okay. So, no. thank you. Thank you. set up. Uh, we have Jesse Cole with us. Uh, he's a research, glass research scientist from Corning. Uh, have an opportunity to hear a little bit more on his talk here. So, last talk of today until we head over to, to see Catherine uh, and the final talk. So Jesse, we'll give it over to you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to join you today. I will apologize in advance. Uh, this talk really isn't central uh, to the art of scientific glass blowing. If people saw my last talk at the ASGS conference in Corning, you may see a few recycled slides. Um, but that being said, um, you know, and kind of echoing what you know Dr. Bennett had conveyed in his talk, you know, glass has shaped our society and continues to do so. So I hope that. Uh, Along the way during this talk, you may see something new uh, and provide uh, some inspiration uh, for the medium that we collectively work with. So I'll start by touching on uh, essentially the glass worker and Corning, so a little bit of history. Um, touch on what is the International Year of Glass um, and why we're celebrating it. Uh, and, and just briefly kind of reflect on the significance of glass in our world and then spend the balance of the presentation looking at how glass may shape our future. And, and the reason why I chose wind turbine blades is in this part of the country, there's a lot of wind. And in fact, when Christina and I were driving from Des Moines, uh, we couldn't hardly count the number of wind turbines. And I'll also uh, share some work that um, my collaborators and I are uh, focusing on more sustainable colored glasses for art, uh, as well as for science, and offer some conclusions. So I'm a jack of trades, or many trades, master of none. Uh, this is me, uh, that's 10 years and 20 pounds ago, uh, dabbling at the torch. Um, and really, flame working is what got me interested in the science and technology of glass. Um, I found this material aesthetically beautiful and learning a little bit about more of the science, uh, I found that equally beautiful and that's sort of the path that I took uh, in my journey with this material. I work at Sullivan Park, uh, which is Corning Incorporated's research facility uh, in Painted Post, New York. And it's a little over 2 million square feet where we have many different scientists, technicians, and technologists working with glass, ceramics, polymers, and many different materials on sort of a research and development level. Now, it's sad to say that there are fewer and fewer glass blowers within our company. We still do have a scientific glass blower on site uh, who makes many different types of apparatus, fixtures, uh, as well as ampules for melting our non-oxide chalcogenide glasses. Uh, and, and with that said, you know, I really think that you know, glass blowers 
both the furnace glass blower and the slain worker really uh, deserve uh -oh, some significant recognition. Christina, I think I have a charger perhaps behind, it's right behind the computer next to Madge. I knew it was inches away from death. So looking at this kind of collection of images, uh, the top left is really how Corning began. It started uh, as a blank making factory where gaffers made thick objects that were carved and cut during the American drilling period. But really the company came into its own after it developed its own version of a borosilicate glass, first called Non-X for non-expansion, later marketed as Pyrex. And it was really the scientific glass blower that shaped this material into many of the products that Corning became known for. And so we see a picture of a scientific glass blower Corning putting the fin finishing touches on a distillation cow. And later, you know, there were many uh, contributions to um, different types of medical sciences. This uh, image kind of at the center came from the Corning Gaffer publication, which was an internal publication that came out. And this highlights the making of these different types of reactor vessels for Dr. Salt, who invented the polio vaccine. So there's lots of different contributions you know, that the glass blower has made. The other thing I want to point out in reflecting on the glass maker, there's really a unique link at Corning, and I think at many other institutions, uh, of, of this intuitive knowledge of, of glass that the glass worker possesses and, and how that translated into uh, the method of making and mass production of glass. And the one great example is the Corning ribbon machine, which really you can think of as making electric light affordable for the average person because traditionally before these machines were invented, electric light bulb envelopes were hand blown. So you could imagine it being a fairly laborious process making these expensive. But it was a glass blower who observed glass flowing from a hole in a shovel that got the idea that we could make a ribbon of glass in which a bubble was blown through a metal orifice plate or plate with a circular aperture. And so that became the ribbon machine. The glass blower's name is William Wood. And if I can recall, the mechanical engineer was David Bray, and that was a pretty unique partnership. And another example is that being low loss optical fiber. And so you can see. Uh, a glass remote maker uh, crafting a preform uh, that would then be drawn into fiber. So I think there's a lot of instances of Corning and beyond where not only did the glass maker create objects of value that contributed to society, uh, but also did so in, in fairly kind of indirect and unique ways. So the International Year of Glass is really aims to celebrate this, and there were various institutions. I'm going to have to read off the slide. Uh, such as the International Commission on Glass, uh, the Community of Glass Associations, and there's one more uh, that I wrote down, the International Committee for Museums and Collections of Glass, you know, reflected on the contributions that it's made throughout our world and lobbied the United Nations uh, to recognize this formally. And so in May of 2021, the UN General Council approved a resolution uh, to make 2022 the United Nations International Year of Glass, to celebrate and reflect on the latest thinking, how glass can be, uh, in a sense, used in the aid of developing a more just and sustainable society, uh, to highlight the most recent scientific and technical breakthroughs, and really showcase its influence on art, history, and the role of museums. So I was reviewing this talk with my wife, Christina, who's here today, and you know, had had written a pretty detailed history, but she said, you know, this is the wrong crowd for that. But you know, as as Dr. Bennett pointed out, you know, glass has been used, you know, for thousands of years. Seven hundred thousand years ago, we saw people first starting to use obsidian uh, as a means of cutting, um, and continue to do so this day. And and we started making it ourselves around 3500 BCE, and the rest is history. But suffice it to say. Uh, like this chart and many others online, you can reflect on the great many ways it has contributed through society, uh, and these developments happened throughout human history. I made this slide just, you know, kind of as a thought exercise, I'll highlight a few of these, you know, but really we touch and interact with glass in many direct and indirect ways, you know, direct ways we touch our cell phones and computer touch screens, we watch TV, more indirect ways like sending an email, but when you think of it, the internet itself, how we communicate and transfer data is really done with glass 
through low loss optical fiber. Uh, flying on a plane got me thinking, you know, a lot of materials right now, such as glass reinforced plastic, can provide similar strength uh, to that of carbon fiber, uh, but can be made in a much lower cost thanks to glass. So there's many other ways uh, listed here and not, um, you know, that, that it complements and enhances our lives. So looking specifically at wind turbines, and again, you know, this is a fitting part of the U.S. Uh, for this exercise and kind of, you know, reflecting on this technology, you know, it, uh, I would say sustainable or renewable energy is not a one-size-fits-all technology. It's very geographically dependent. Wind turbines certainly have their challenges, like solar in terms of you can harvest, but you also have to store the energy. And right now, there is still difficulty in recycling uh, these, there we go, uh, these blades. Uh, but one, one way that glass can help is, is kind of interesting. So looking at this plot, you can find different uh, metrics online, but essentially as these things have gotten bigger, meaning the blades themselves have gotten larger, uh, so you have diameter of the rotor on the axis, this is time, but highlighted here uh, above each uh, wind turbine, you can see the amount of energy that it's capable of harvesting. And really the, the takeaway here if you look at the map below, is that you know the power that's available is directly proportional to the rotor diameter. And the consequence, though, is that when you make these things bigger, they get heavier. And so it's this sort of square cube law. Your energy capture goes to the second power, but if you use the same materials to make your blades, they get heavier by the third power. And so really looking at how do you how do you try to rectify this, it really becomes looking at advanced materials, specifically carbon fiber, but also glass. And so this is really where the role of you know people like myself and, and, and many others, you know, look for these advanced material solutions. So how do you make a better glass and what does a better glass mean in this case? And this is some work from Nippon Electric Glass, and, and there's a lot of other glass companies kind of exploring this space. But really the critical property, um, or one of the critical properties, is the Young's modulus of the glass or really the stiffness. Because if you make a larger blade with conventional glasses like e-glass, the flexure of that blade as it gets larger becomes problematic. So if you can design a glass that has a higher Young's modulus, you can make the blade longer, Thus, you're collecting more energy uh, simultaneously, sort of uh, making it less heavy than using traditional materials, and you can preserve the same amount of flexure or stiffness. And so, just touching on how this can be done, you know, here are your sort of conventional glass oxide uh, constituents, you know, that are used in commercial glasses. So, your first two rows on the periodic tables are your alkali and alkaline earth modifiers. Silica is commonly your backbone. Uh, and then you can add other uh, refractory species like zirconia or rare earth elements. And using a combination of this approach, you can increase your modulus. And really the takeaway for the glassmaker at a very high level is replacing um, conventional modifiers with higher field strength elements. So if you look at this chart here, looking at field strength versus Young's modulus in gigapascals, Say, for example, if we replace potassium and sodium with lithium, we can increase the yields modulus. And again, in life, nothing is for free because lithium is used for lots of other technologies like batteries. Um, but there are other species that can be introduced into the glass. And, and the other, uh, like, like, for example, magnesium and zinc, and really the other uh, added benefit of doing so is the changes, the coordination number of certain species like the alumina. Uh, then this chart here going from four to five coordinated, which has also going to increase the modulus. And there are many examples um, like this throughout glass technology that are aiding in making more energy efficient vehicles, again, by uh, decreasing weight, increasing mechanical performance. So I think glass will continue to play uh, a pretty important role. So I'll pivot and now talk about some of the work that my collaborators and I are conducting on making more sustainable uh, colored glass for what I consider the art and craft community, uh, as well as for optical filters, which you can think of an optical filter as sort of a colored glass with a college education. It's designed to absorb 
specific wavelengths of light, uh, and there are many different applications, which I'll touch on uh, in a minute. So when you think about colored glass for art and science, there are a lot of different uses. There's a lot of different colored container glass that we see. Uh, it's for aesthetic purposes, and again, as mentioned, optical filters. And the challenge you know, that, that the glassmaker faces when, when thinking about colored glass is that oftentimes the pretty colors are made with the sort of naughty elements on the periodic table, uh, those that uh, have pretty significant environmental consequences, cadmium and selenium being the ones that come to mind because those are how you make very beautiful yellow, orange, and red colors. Uh, and there were others like chromium uh, and silver, which are rep for metals, meaning resource conservation, recovery action. These are regulated. Um, and and it's, it's challenging. And the other component that the glassmaker faces is that when you're making colored glass in bulk, uh, you can oftentimes have a lot of waste. So say, for example, if you have a tank that produces thousands of pounds of glass an hour, if you want to go from a blue glass in that tank to a red one, it's going to take a couple of weeks to flush the tank out. So during that time, you are making unsellable glass that is off target, that oftentimes is landfill. Now, there are improvements uh, that we've seen color cell or what they call four hearth coloring technology that's shown schematically here where you have a large tank of clear glass that is distributed through these channels to what's called a four heart and you can sprinkle in a color concentrate so basically a low melting fritted glass uh, that is then chemically homogenized or excuse me mechanically homogenized into your clear glass and that makes it a little more efficient because when you want to change a color, all you have to do is flush out that forehearth. But again, the consequence is that you have to make a lot of other glasses to act as colorants. Uh, and again, raw material, uh, inventory, uh, and, and, and again, you know, there, there's still waste in this process. So, you know, jokingly, you know, the holy grail, so to speak, is a color tunable glass or glass ceramic where one size fits all. And so pardon the esoteric analogy from my, my hobbies, uh, but back in the days of silent films, uh, when there was no soundtrack and no dialogue, at first theater owners uh, would hire orchestras to provide accompaniment, but nobody wants to pay a whole bunch of musicians. So uh, Hope Jones and later uh, the Rudolph Wurlitzer company built what they called the single unit orchestra. So a pipe organ that was tuned to sound like a orchestra. And so you only needed to pay one musician and buy this, you know, 10 ton box of whistles. So, you know, again, can, can, we, can we make a single unit orchestra out of glass? And there's been a lot of examples through history where people have either inadvertently or deliberately tried, you know, using plasmonic noble metal nanoparticles, you can tune the color based on the size and shape. So this is the Lycurgus cup, which has a cocktail of metallic particles. That's why you have a difference in reflected and transmitted light. The example at right is a gold containing uranium lead silicate made by Thomas Webb and Son in the late 19th century. The yellow color is from your uranium lead base glass. The remaining colors are from metallic gold particles of varying size. Uh, difficult to control, and again, you're using conflict minerals, regulated species, uh, and, and again, while exotic, it's not necessarily going to be practical. This is an example uh, from Corning's past. It's called Armistead Rainbow Glass. Bill Armistead was a research scientist, later the director of the lab. This piece of glass shown here at the top was treated in a gradient furnace. Uh, it contained particles of, or sort of little crystals of silver chloride that when heat treated would become partially reduced. And what was interesting is that this glass was made in a sense before the language that described the scientific phenomenon came to be. You know, this came about in the early 1930s, and really what Armistead was doing was basically some nanoengineering of plasmonic metal particles. So this is an interesting example from a paper by Pietro Bond published in 2009, which coincidentally, if you look at this range of colors, it's almost exactly what Armistead observed. And what's happening here is that you're starting with the precipitation of metallic silver particles, the yellow aqueous solution spherical particles, but Armistead, in his sort of serendipitous discovery, could grow anisotropic particles, meaning little rod-like structures, and by subsequent heat treatment, he could increase the aspect ratio of these rods, which results in a change in how they interact with light, or the change in plasma resonance. Shown here, these rods support two different types of modes, a transverse and longitudinal mode, and by changing the aspect ratio, you can change 
the energy at which those modes attenuate, uh, giving rise to these characteristic range of colors. Uh, we are in the state of Iowa, and I want to mention Dr. Don Stuckey, who was a Coe College alum and one of Corning's uh, really kind of remarkable scientists. Uh, his discovery, which he called full color photosensitive glass, again, never found a home in a commercial product, uh, but scientifically was remarkable because, you know, this plate, or excuse me, this plate and this business card looks like it's been printed on, but in reality, that color was developed within the body of the glass. And again, tuning the size and shape of the metallic particles that were precipitated. Now, unfortunately, like um, Armistead's discovery, this required a uh, fairly exotic cocktail of oxides, a glass that contained volatile species halogens such as fluorine, bromine, and iodine. So you could make it in the lab, but it was difficult to scale. And so, you know, this was one of what Stuckey considered his you know, crowning achievement, but unfortunately never made a sense for the company. So, you know, there's a lot of serendipitous discovery of Corning, and I think in glass in general, and one that uh, my collaborator, Matt Deneke, and I stumbled across while trying to make a more energy efficient uh, solar shielding glass for car sunroofs, we found that we could make a polychromatic glass ceramic. And, you know, at the time, the auto business wanted a neutral gray color. And the glass that we had was blue, and we changed the composition one day, and I heated it to a higher temperature and it made red. And at the time, I was pretty frustrated. I said, okay, we don't have our neutral gray. But Matt said, well, how many glasses do you know can make blue and red? I said, all right, can we take it? And so we started noodling with the heat treatment time and temperature and found that we could make this entire range of colors from a single composition of glass. And what's lucky about this material is it contains no rare metals. Uh, it's quite well behaved in a melting tank. And so, you know, this gave us hope that we could use this um, for something practical, perhaps not just an academic curiosity. What's cool about it as well is you can make radiance and color if you heat treat in a gradient furnace. Um, Corning still makes glass sunglass lenses, so we had a fleeting idea, okay, not, not a very noble achievement, but, you know, instead of putting a coating on a piece of glass, could we develop a tint within the body of the glass itself and prove that we could? Uh, you can actually heat treat this in reducing atmospheres and make these rather nice reflective surfaces. And what's curious about them is that they're quite resistant to acid because this occurs kind of below the surface of the glass. So you could take, you know, one of these parts and dump it into concentrated acid and that reflective surface still stays. I'm not sure what we'll do with that or if we can do with it, anything with it, but interesting uh, food for thought. You can write logos in this. Um, and the chemistry, which I'll touch on, which is the cool part, instead of changing the size and shape like we did with the noble metal particles, we're changing the chemistry of these nanoparticles, which remain essentially the size, shape, same size and shape irrespective of color. And so really what we're doing is we're tuning the band gap by what we dope into these and how much we dope it. So basically by tuning less chemistry and thermal treatment. We can make non-toxic filter analogs. Again, below, this is a cadmium selenide filter glass used in a laundry list of different devices. We've been able to make a non-toxic version that has a similarly sharp cutoff. So again, lots of possibilities with materials like this uh, and others. And so to conclude, you know, uh, as we've discussed today, glass has been used by humans, you know, since Paleolithic times. It has shaped our society in unexpected ways and continues to play an integral role. Uh, and I'd like to leave you with a quote uh, by an article by Douglas Maine that came out in the Atlantic called Human's Kind, Humankind's Most Important Material. And this quote is, glass's influence doesn't show any sign of waning. Looking to the future, researchers hope to make breakthroughs of similar prominence using glass to bind up nuclear waste, make safer batteries, and fashion biomedical implants. Engineers are also trying to use glass to make sophisticated touchscreen, self-tinting windows, and truly unbreakable glass. So the next time you find yourself before glass of one sort or another, consider how strange it is that this material, born of earth and fire, frozen like the Rhine device on a pond, trapped in atomic purgatory, has facilitated so much human activity and progress. Really see it instead of just looking through it. And without it, there are so many truths that we could not see. So, thank you. Do we have time for a few questions? 
Yes, sir. Are you able to change the refractive index on exposure to wind? I wish we could. We, we have a very modest delta N that we can achieve, um, but really on the order that's similar to, say, a fictive temperature change. So imagine if the glass was rapidly quenched versus annealed. So the crystals themselves, I think because the crystals first are in low abundance and the actual delta index or the chemistry change during that color change really doesn't manifest in a large delta N. So <laughs> good question. Another, another old that one, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, so your colored glass is a nanoparticle which I'm sure you're not going to tell us <laughs> I will say this. Well, there's a lot of information in our patents that talk about these, and very generally speaking, when you look at families of substoichiometric doped oxides such as vanadium, molybdenum, tungsten, titanium, partially reduced species of those crystals doped with alkali, alkalinerts can give rise to these types of coloration. Uh, so that's really kind of the space that we're playing in with this technology. So can can I take one of those pieces, melt and shape it into something that will retain its color, or by what is it what I change it? So in the working process, and this is something, and actually some of these are really nice to flame work with because they're like a 50 to 55 CPE and they're borosilicates. So these would be very familiar to most of us in this room. Um, during working, generally speaking, they would remain colorless. And the reason being is that as the object is being heated and shaped, it would still be amorphous. And so you could take a finished object and develop the color by a thermal treatment. And so that's where I would expect the color to come from. And if it were treated in a isothermal environment where you had the same temperature across the piece, you would have the same color, whereas if, for example, if you used a gradient in temperature, you could achieve a gradient in color, or if you used either local heat sinks or reflectors, so you could, in a sense, selectively tune the color. Do you have time for one more question? You got it. Yes. Did you bring any examples? I did. I'm sorry. Uh, this is, this is, uh, I, I slid, the, the lawyers were kind enough to, to bless these slides. I did not slither out with any souvenirs, but, but uh, I, I will say this in, in all seriousness, standing invitation, if, if anyone is in the area and would like to reach out, you know, there are opportunities for tours and it'd be a pleasure to host any of you. So oh, if, yeah. if you're in the private uh, court in New York, uh, look me up, I'm on LinkedIn, and I think if, and if, if there's a way of getting people my email, I'm happy to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That concludes this, but before you all run away, um, I know on the ASGS kind of a agenda was kind of a dinner tonight. We didn't really find a happy location that was going to be within our budget sort of thing. But the plan is after Catherine's talk, um, I'm going to head out to 30 Hop. A little bit of a drive, but we're going to head out to 30 Hop. Uh, they're open until 10. Have some decent food and have some dinner. Sorry, did you say 30 Hop? 30. 30. 30 here on tap, if you kind of think about that. Uh, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs>